It may be the largest mass UFO sighting ever witnessed over America. Woo! Woo! March 13, 1997. The skies above Arizona ignite. Major sighting here. Fiery globes seen by thousands. They started multiplying. One light became two lights, a third, a fourth. Reports of an ultra-silent aircraft, seemingly as large as a battleship. It was so big, I could not see the front, the back, side to side of this craft. Do ancient clues over 1,000 years old show a pattern? It looks like a saucer with fire. Or could it be a top secret government program? There are large vehicles that fit the descriptions you heard. And what does the state's former governor now say? I describe what I saw as being otherworldly. This is case number 97202, Arizona Lights. Something is in the sky and something is happening and I'll go to my death knowing that what I saw was true. Thousands of people all over Arizona saw something that night. I believe the Phoenix lights are real and that's a fact. On the evening of March 13th, 1997, residents throughout Phoenix, Arizona are outside looking skyward. The large number of spectators are there to gaze at the Hale-Bopp Comet, a comet last seen more than 2,000 years ago. But instead, something else appears in the darkness, something quite unexpected, a mass sighting that came to be known as the Phoenix Lights. What people saw on March 13th, 1997, put Hale Bop to shame. The most famous aspect of the case is the videotape footage of anomalous lights that appeared over Phoenix around 10 p.m. According to eyewitnesses, the lights seen are red or orange in color and appear to blink on. They also very interestingly describe them as, as hovering or, or maintaining altitude. They don't, they don't seem to descend over time. But the 10 o'clock lights are only part of a complicated story. Earlier that same evening, reports flood in from across the state of additional sightings. Some describe a V-shaped formation of lights while others claim they see an actual boomerang-shaped craft. According to the eyewitnesses, what is seen in the skies above Arizona is absolutely enormous. Reports describe the craft as being nearly a mile wide. At times, it hovers silently in the night sky, but it is also capable of achieving incredible speeds. Clearly, this massive craft is unlike anything known to exist. The people who watched it were actually in shock. Woo, look at that. I got that Wait. one on video. The boomerang is allegedly spotted as early as 7.55 p.m. in Henderson, Nevada, then in Paulden, Arizona at 8.15, Prescott at 8.17, Phoenix at 8.30, and Tucson at 8.45. No images of this massive craft are known to exist. Are these separate sightings or different aspects of the same event? The investigation aims to find the answers to the numerous events in Arizona's crowded skies. Pat Usker will uncover local history of UFO sightings in the Phoenix area. I think we're really talking about something that, that is either so top secret that it's decades ahead of what we know, or we're looking at a genuine extraterrestrial visitation here. Dr. Ted Ackworth will examine the video evidence of the 10 o'clock lights 
and will conduct an experiment to replicate the event. One thing I want to look at closely is the dynamic aspect of these lights, how they move or don't move through the night sky. And Bill Burns will analyze the nature of the alleged boomerang craft. A lot of people say that the craft over Phoenix that night at 8 o'clock was an extraterrestrial spacecraft. The investigation has enlisted the help of documentary filmmaker James Fox. He has been chasing this mystery since 1997. I have been investigating this for quite some time. Something very large flew over the state of Arizona, and to this day it remains inexplicable. Lights in the sky over Phoenix are nothing new. Carved into these mountain rocks are ancient clues that the Hohokam Indians may have seen UFOs more than 1,000 years ago. The night skies over Phoenix seem to have a history of strange events that led to the 1997 mass sighting and through to the present day. I believe they were not of this, of this world. And I thought, wow, I'm just seeing things that most people are never going to see in a lifetime. These events occurred over 11 years ago. Why are people still talking about them? The eyewitnesses aren't buying the explanation. UFO hunters asked for and received an official statement from the Air Force in regard to the 10 o'clock lights over Phoenix on March 13, 1997. It states, that the lights were caused by LUU-2 illumination flares dropped by A-10 Thunderbolts. The Maryland Air National Guard performed the drop as a training mission over the Barry Goldwater mountain range. The only explanation is flares from the Maryland National Guard. They're saying that there were flares dropped from the Air National Guard, and, and uh, I think a lot of the witnesses in the videotaped evidence will suggest otherwise. As the initial step in his investigation, Pat checks in with Richard Ruelas, a reporter for the Arizona Republic. Ruelas has been covering the Phoenix Lights phenomenon since the beginning. A lot of times, uh, UFOs are seen in little small rural areas. This was an event over a major city, and a lot of people saw it. So it's not something that could be easily discounted. But apparently there were two, in uh, two events. One of the big confusions about the Phoenix Lights is that there were two separate incidents that night. Around 8 o'clock, people see a V formation. About 10 o'clock, there are hovering orbs on the western part of Phoenix. That's not what most people saw. Most people who saw the Phoenix Lights on the ground saw this V overhead. An important figure in the story of the Phoenix Lights is Councilwoman Frances Emma Barwood. On May 6, 1997, citing public safety concerns, Barwood asks for an official investigation into the incidents of March 13th. Just the mere mention of a politician that we should spend state or government resources on investigating a UFO gets her laughed at. Why would people stick their necks out and get burned uh, when there was really nothing going on that night. For me to imagine that it was much ado about nothing, I, I think maybe it was much ado about something. All Francis said was, as a matter of public safety, what's hovering over the city of Phoenix? The word UFO was never uttered. She never said the word ET, extraterrestrial, flying saucer, spacecraft. She never said it. I couldn't understand, why doesn't anybody want to know the truth? The Arizona Republic did cartoons with, you know, I think it was flying saucers going in one ear and out the other, and another one with a switch on the side of my head going off. Not only do they not want to know, it's like thou doth protest too much. So Francis, what sort of response was there? I started getting phone calls at 7 o'clock in the morning. It didn't stop until 11 o'clock that night, and over the summer, we take a break, and I tried to call back everybody. I called over 700 people. Did you pursue any investigation on your own to follow up on this? I referred all the phone calls to the governor, mm -hmm. Governor Symington at the time. 
Arizona's governor, Fife Symington, is pressured to find an answer to the sightings. He calls a press conference on the morning of June 19, 1997. Symington states that he will look into the issue. And we're going to get to the bottom of it. We're going to find out if it was a UFO. Later that same afternoon, the governor calls for another unscheduled press conference. And now I'll ask Officer Stein and his colleagues to escort the accused into the room so that we may all look upon the guilty party. And he starts talking about the Phoenix Lights. And we thought, wow, you know, he's really going to check into this. Anyway, out, out walks his uh, chief of staff in this um, costume and like an extraterrestrial. And we realized this was a big joke. <laughs> you know, first of all, not at all like Fife. Doesn't have a sense of humor. This just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. <laughs> was it your perception or is it your perception to this day that there was something organized against you because you dared to ask that question? once at a city council meeting? It seems that way. So many people wanted to know the answers. And never did I have anybody negative from my constituents or anybody in the city or anybody in the state. The negativity came from government officials. But other details emerge strange video taken in the days, months, even years before the mass sighting may hold clues. And the governor, who laughed at first, now makes a stunning reversal. What did he see with his own eyes? I saw a large delta-shaped dark object. That night, we've seen a bunch of lights appear, like over uh, towards South Mountain area. The March 13, 1997 sightings in Arizona are complicated, combining multiple sightings across the state. An immense boomerang-like aircraft, sometimes reported as five lights in a V-shaped formation, and perhaps most famously, a series of red-orange orbs above Phoenix. Bill and James Fox are meeting with Mike Kristen, an eyewitness to the Phoenix Lights. Hey, go look at this. Oh my God. On March 13th, 1997, Mike is out on his balcony enjoying the cool night air when he spots a bright orange light in the distance. You tell me what it is. So I went in to get my video camera to shoot it, and as I was doing that, it went out and another light appeared to the right of this thing, a little bit lower. And that light went on. Then another one went on. Before I knew it, this entire array of lights had gone on. Eight or nine lights, and they formed this arc. I videotaped that for about two and a half minutes, and then the lights started, slowly started to go off one at a time, and not in the same order that they went on. The Air Force's explanation for the lights is that they were caused by LUU-2 illumination flares. According to official documents, the flares were dropped from A-10 Thunderbolts as part of an annual training exercise called Operation Snowbird. The flares were ignited over the Barry Goldwater Gunnery Range, beyond the Estrella Mountains. Both are visible from Mike's house. Had you ever seen a light like that before in your I, life? I had not. I've always seen maybe one or two lights or so off in the distance. And this is the first time I've ever seen them this far to the east. They were extremely bright compared to any of the lights I have seen before. And I thought it was unusual the way they held their pattern. Is that what the flares usually do that you've seen in the past? No. Flares will drop in different rates. They will drift because of the wind, and they won't hold the pattern. Lights that Mike saw 
One, looked nothing like the flares he'd seen before. Two, they were preceded by an orange orb that Mike couldn't identify. Could they have been different types of flares? Those are the questions we have to answer. What do you think you captured on videotape that night? It could have been one of three things in my estimation. Number one, it could have been a hoax, which I don't think it could have been a hoax because it was pretty elaborate. Uh, it could have been an alien spacecraft, but I have no proof of that. And the only other thing that I can figure out could be is some kind of a military experiment. Some of the behaviors of these lights strike me as strange, as described by the witnesses, and therefore they definitely bear further investigation. Ted sets his sights on a flare experiment he plans to conduct in California's Long Beach Harbor. Using hand-launched maritime parachute flares, he will test the military's explanation. Another witness to the 10 o'clock lights over Phoenix is Dr. Lynn Kitai, a physician and documentary filmmaker. Dr. Kitai chooses to remain anonymous for seven years after the incident. In 2004, at great risk to her professional reputation, she comes forward with the stunning revelation that these lights have appeared before. I was experiencing these phenomena for two years prior to the mass sighting. I had a very close sighting to our home. I tried to take everything in, the size, the shape, the color. Uh, they were about three to six feet each. They were orbs. There was a uniform amber color throughout. It didn't glare at all. According to Dr. Kitai, another set of lights appeared in January 1997, two months before the mass sightings over Phoenix. She sees what she believes to be a massive triangular formation, and she manages to capture the triangle shape on film. There were six points of light that seemed to be attached to something, moving slowly in tandem behind South Mountain. After seeing strange lights in both February 1995 and January 1997, Dr. Kitai is not surprised when she sees some familiar lights two months later on March 13th. I saw the six lights pop on, mm -hmm. and I fumbled with my camera okay. to get out there really quick, and by the time I got it focused, that's what I saw. And we're looking in the direction of South Mountain? Yes, to the airport. So Lynn, just to play devil's advocate for a minute, what would you say to someone who suggested that what you saw was a military flare? There is no way that it could have been military. Military flares flicker and they can't keep a formation. They drift with the wind. These were orbs. Another eyewitness who manages to capture his experience on tape is Stephen Blonder, the author of Oracle of the Phoenix. And like Dr. Kitai, March 13th was not the first time that Steve and his neighbor, Jaylene Brugman, claimed to have seen something inexplicable in the Phoenix sky. March 10th was the first night that I saw strange lights in the sky. Did you see it on there? Yeah, the I got it on the tape. I got out my video camera, and I started filming this thing, trying to get a, a close-up of what it was. And it was this orange pulsating light that was unlike anything I'd ever seen in my life. Uh, Jaylene, how did you get involved in this? His wife, Susie, came over the next day and just was in, like, shock and said, we saw an UFO last night. For the next three nights, Steve's balcony becomes the scene of nightly viewing parties. Susie, they're back. And each night, they are not disappointed. But it's the sighting on the 13th that captivates Steve and Jaylene as well as the rest of Phoenix. Major sighting here. That's, no, there's five. Oh! Another one just showed up. Like the other eyewitnesses to the lights, 
neither Steve nor Jaylene accept the official explanation for what they saw that night. I was very upset when I saw the flare story come out because I knew it wasn't flares. The flares that Angie claimed they dropped were LUU2 illumination flares. The eyewitnesses were surprised that there wasn't any illumination or, or sky lit up around the flares. But it is possible that the environmental conditions that night wouldn't have allowed for that kind of reflection around the flare. UFO Hunters invites Jaylene and her husband Jason, also an eyewitness that night, to participate in an experiment spearheaded by Ted in Long Beach, California. We're doing the best we can to approximate what would have been the kind of military flares that would have been deployed from aircraft. And we'll just see if our witnesses who saw the lights over Phoenix think that these lights look like the military explanation. The team is using standard maritime flares in place of the LUU-2 military flares. Maritime flares are used by ships in distress to visually signal rescuers. When launched, they shoot nearly 1,000 feet into the air. Both the LUU-2 and maritime flares are deployed with parachutes, and Ted is primarily interested in the way the flare's flight characteristics are perceived by the witnesses. Well, I have no way of predicting what's going to happen. We'll just have to launch these flares and see what they look like. We're all ready to shoot. We've got five flares. Make sure they're looking at the trajectory. That's one of the most important aspects here in the test. OK, we're going live in 10 seconds. The flares are sent aloft. Now it's up to the witnesses to decide. But could there be another military angle to this case? The lights over Phoenix could mask one of the largest clandestine government projects ever created, a top secret stealth aircraft that is utterly enormous. The UFO hunters are in Long Beach, California, conducting a flare experiment with Jaylene and Jason Brugman eyewitnesses to the so-called Phoenix Lights event of March 13, 1997. The official explanation put forward by the Air National Guard is that the lights over Phoenix were flares, LUU-2 flares dropped from A-10 warthogs. Because Ted is primarily concerned with the flight characteristics, he'll substitute one parachute flare for another using maritime flares instead of the LUU-2s. They are easier to control, and the eyewitnesses can be closer to the source of light. Do you have any special instructions for the witnesses? They want to make sure the witnesses are looking at a few different things, primarily uh, the trajectories of the flares. As they float down, they follow the, a similar trajectory to what they had seen in Phoenix. OK, guys, we are locked and loaded. Eyes in the sky in 10 seconds. Okay. I'll take one. OK, you ready? Yes. One. There it is. That's the first one. Let's call it in. Okay, calling Pat and Bill. So how was it? Uh, what I noticed is even though they were, the other ones came on at different times, but they all were staying in the line. The ones that we saw were hovering, maintained altitude. They never dropped. Uh, yeah. The lights went out at the same altitude. Would you guys say what you saw that night is totally different from what you just saw right now? totally different from what uh, these flares showed here tonight. We do know there are many other witnesses, and some of the things they've described just do not seem possibly consistent with flares. The hang times, uh, the blinking on and off. 
the spread over the distance, the velocities just are not consistent with any kind of flare configuration that I could imagine. So it really leaves me wondering overall whether or not it could have been flares in 97. With eyewitnesses discounting flares in the field test, Ted turns to the video from that night to see if any other characteristics of the lights could be distinguished. Ted and image analyst Terence Masson study the 10 o'clock footage from both Mike Kristen and Steve Blonder. We have a source from Mike in the northern part of Phoenix and Steve, who is in the sort of the southern side. They're about 15 miles apart, roughly, uh, across the basin. It seems that they've both taken footage of what appears on initial analysis to be the same thing. To the naked eye, the lights in the footage seem to be over the city. After several minutes, the lights appear to blink out. There are theories that they're flares that are flaming out. Now, the curious thing is that when they go off, they don't go off in order. If they were flares getting dropped out of a, an aircraft successively, and their burn times are approximately equal, right. they'd probably flare out so in order as well. Though the behavior of the lights seems to contradict the flare explanation, their physical appearance may back up the Air Force's claims. So regarding the LUU-2 flare theory from the military, we know chromatically they're pretty white. What do you think from the footage here? Is that consistent with the military's explanation? It seems to be, but as we've seen many times, the, uh, the video quality, most of these lights, if they do have any color in them that you see to the naked eye, they're still gonna show up on video as white. It's basically overexposed points right, against black. color. Right. It's not proof that they're flares, but no. it's, it's, it's consistent. Definitely a possibility, right. I I'm on the fence, I guess I'd have to say. It seems pretty unlikely to me that these were a string of flares floating down on parachutes. Um, but then again, we're, we're dealing with appearances. We don't have a lot of quantitative data on this. And I don't really feel that they were flares. And I, you know, I can't quantitatively prove it one way or another. Pat and Bill return to Arizona in order to track down witnesses to the other multiple sightings on the night of March 13th, 1997. They are on the trail of an alleged second object seen on the same night. Witnesses report a boomerang-shaped craft flying over the state of Arizona between 8 and 10 p.m. Because there are no known photographs or video of this alleged massive craft, UFO Hunters has enlisted the help of John Bavaresco, a sketch artist and computer graphic expert. Based on multiple eyewitness testimonies, John will create a composite image of what was in the skies over Arizona that night. 8.13 p.m., March 13, 1997. Dana Valentine is sitting on the back porch of his father's house when he sees five lights in a V formation approach. I watched a little longer and came by about 10 minutes, and I figured these, these should have been on top of me by now. Intrigued, Dana brings his father outside to watch the lights with him. We couldn't tell if it was five units or one huge one, but as it got closer, we believed that it was starting to be one big one because it was just a huge. So it looked like it did have a body shape to it. Well, it definitely was one big object to me. How big There's, would you say that it was? If I had to go from the left light to the right light, I'd have to say probably close to a mile. John takes the visual details and puts the information into the CGI program. He shows the image to Dana. OK, what I've done here is an animation of a direct overhead shot, basically, on how you witnessed it as it passed over. The lights look good, the size is right, that's definitely, that's definitely what I saw. Dana's description of the V formation is consistent with other witness testimony. A mile from tip to tip, five large lights, and completely noiseless in flight. Bill, James, and John meet with another witness, Terry Mansfield, who claims to have observed a boomerang-shaped craft. All of a sudden, one of my volunteers pointed straight up and said, oh my gosh, what's that? And we all looked straight up. First thing I noticed was there were no more stars. I couldn't see the stars anymore in the sky. And it appeared as if there were a uh, black 
shimmery, satiny piece of material right over my head. Terry seems to see details that few others report. The craft seems to shimmer in the night sky. It was so big, I could not see the front, the back, side to side of this craft. It was, so was it so large that yes. it, it spanned from horizon to from horizon? The, then? In the, where I was standing, I could not see the edges right. of this, whatever it was that was flying overhead. You said you saw a surface on the bottom of this craft, and it was kind of shimmering. Really, it was as if there was a soft ripple of an undulation. It was very fluid. I felt like I could reach up and touch it. Terry's past experience makes her a knowledgeable witness when it comes to aircraft. Having been in the Air Force with my husband for 22 years and my father-in-law is an Air Force pilot for 26 years, we've seen jets, we've seen planes, we've seen helicopters, we've seen all kinds of military aircraft. Well, I think I've got something here that could represent what uh, Terry saw. Let's see if wow. this works yes. out. You've got the undulation just right. Yeah. You've got the, uh, we've got black, silvers, a little bit right. of grays. It looks very fluid. Very, very similar to what I saw is, you know, Right, it's just because the whole screen is uh, covered with what I saw that night, which right. is, that's exactly. The sure. thing's just enormous. One of the most powerful forms of evidence is a corroborating witness testimony from people who don't know each other, never heard of each other. So what this does for the case is it, it adds another mosaic tile to a much larger picture orbs, a mysterious string of lights, and a massive V-shaped object that appears to undulate are all reported over Phoenix in March 1997. Are these sightings all related or completely separate incidents? And is it possible that the technology responsible is a top secret invention of our own? There are large vehicles that sort of fit some of the descriptions you heard. Whatever was going over my head, it seemed to be so low that I could reach up and touch it, and it uh, was absolutely silent. Video evidence from March 13, 1997, has shown strange light formations in the Phoenix skies, and numerous witnesses have reported seeing unexplained objects and other orbs hovering above Arizona. Is there something about this area that attracts these objects. Pat meets Jeff Woolwine, a UFO researcher at the foot of the White Tank Mountains. These hills are riddled with petroglyphs, rock art carved into the landscape primarily by the Hohokam, a Native American people who lived here from 200 BCE to 1400 CE and then mysteriously disappeared. Clearly, the whole calm we're seeing, things in the sky as we're seeing now, strange objects, strange lights, if you will. They didn't have video cameras back then. They had stone boulders to record something significant, something to remember in history. They wanted to, to copy this down so people would understand what had happened here. Pat and Jeff hiked to the spot where strange petroglyphs have been found. Among the petroglyphs is an image Jeff believes to be significant. You'll notice this interesting line here. It has a block here, a block here, a block here, and a line. In today's world, what we like to call them is barbells. Barbell-shaped UFOs, like this one videotaped over Phoenix on January 24, 2005, are well known to modern researchers. It's possible that local tribes people were inspired to record their own sightings on these very rocks nearly a millennium ago. And when you say barbell, you mean a barbell-shaped UFO? Barbell-shaped UFO, correct. Right now, I'm, I'm looking at glyphs that are very interesting, but again, they are Jeff's interpretation. You could speculate, it could be the sun, a star, but it could also be a, a light in the sky. That's correct. These people could have been recording UFOs, or they could have been recording uh, celestial events, uh, you know, stars, comets, that sort of thing. So uh, at this time, it's just a theory, but uh, it's a very interesting one. While Jeff's interpretation is a personal one, 
Even government experts who have studied the petroglyphs for years have difficulty explaining some of the images. Doc Tallboys is a park ranger and works with the Arizona State Historical Preservation Office on the study, cataloging and mapping of all the sites in the White Tank Mountain Regional Park. So, Doc, what's your take on the White Tang Mountain petroglyphs? The Hohokams really observed what was going on around them. They had, uh, they were great observers of celestial events, seasonal events. So they really left us a, an interesting pictorial history of that from their point of view. We have pictures that could look like alien beings, men wearing helmets. We have one obvious one that look at it one way, it looks like a saucer with fire coming out of the bottom. We're strictly speculating on what these things mean. We have no idea what they mean, because there's no Rosetta Stone. There is no bridge to translating what they might have been. But while the mysteries of the ancient petroglyphs are hidden by history, the truth behind the light seen over Arizona may have been intentionally kept secret. In nearby Mesa, Arizona, Bill and James Fox arrive at the Arizona Wing Commemorative Air Force Museum. They are meeting with aviation expert and author Bill Scott, who did research on a highly classified black operations aircraft for an article in Aviation Week magazine. What he pieced together in his research bears striking similarities to what was witnessed over Phoenix. Apparently it was up to a mile across, it could fly silently, it could hover. Uh, when it took off, the witnesses described it as uh, had they blinked they would have missed it. It was a boomerang shape. Boomerang? Uh, boomerang shape, V shape. You are, have done a lot of research, uh, you've written a lot of articles for Aviation Week and Space Technology. What is your take on this? We came across a number of black programs, you know, highly classified programs, that probably included near neutral buoyancy, in other words it's a a vehicle filled with helium. It had a rigid hull, so we call them rigid hull airships. Some of these were reported as being very large, you know, perhaps the uh, wingspan of a football field. They typically were uh, triangular shaped. Some were sort of boomerang shaped. No pictures, official diagrams, or blueprints of these types of vehicles have been released by the government. If the U.S. military does operate these massive aircraft, they still remain secret. These things might have been developed for special forces operations. Nice thing about this particular vehicle design is it could carry fairly large payloads. So you could put an entire small unit of uh, fully outfitted troops on board. Is there any projected point, at least in your estimation, when these covert aircraft will be revealed to us? They may never be revealed, because as long as it's an advantage, we don't want people to know about them. That's the way the black world thinks. While the rigid hull airship sounds similar to reports of the boomerang, it is not an exact match. Some of the performance characteristics, such as amazing speed, and the strange undulating surface don't seem to be consistent. The rigid hull airships that, that I looked at would not display some of the characteristics that some of your observers did, uh, like this, this idea of blinking out and disappearing immediately. I don't know how to explain that. I'm just saying that there are large vehicles that sort of fit some of the descriptions you heard. Can the events that transpired in Arizona be explained by these covert programs? And are the UFO stories merely part of a disinformation campaign? Former Arizona Governor Fife Symington comes forward to put the issue to rest once and for all. I describe what I saw as being otherworldly. Bill and James Fox are meeting with Fife Symington, the governor of Arizona from 1990 to 1997. On June 19, 1997, the governor holds a press conference and promises to investigate the Phoenix Lights event. But then, later that same afternoon, he calls another conference and brings his chief of staff out before the press dressed as an alien. 
Now, Symington explains his actions. The whole world descended on us. We were just inundated from all over the world, the Peking News Bureau, the BBC, everybody sort of descending on Phoenix about, about the lights over Phoenix and what was happening. So I got together with my staff and uh, made the decision at that point to do a spoof to try to kind of lighten the atmosphere. But I didn't realize I was going to offend so many people. I was just simply trying to kind of add some levity to this atmosphere, which I thought was really starting to get a little too hyped up, a little over the top, too much hysteria. You've said repeatedly that you pursued all these avenues to get to the bottom of what was going on in Phoenix. Uh, in March of 1997. What were those avenues, Governor, and how did you pursue them? I asked my uh, staff to call the commanding officer at Luke Air Force Base and to call the head of the Department of Public Safety and the general who was in charge of our guard to try to find out what, you know, what it was. And the Air Force totally blanked us. They, they just said, we have no comment. That was, that was it. No comment. Not we don't know, but no comment. We have no comment. That's unacceptable, though, isn't it? I mean, that's just not oh. acceptable. Yeah, well. You have to know what, what flies around in your airspace, right? As a governor, you know that no comment means a lot more than we don't know, there's nothing there. Well, I know as a governor, the worst comment that a governor could make is no comment to the press. No comment means there's something to comment about. So for the first time, we found out that the Air Force knew there was something there, but would not talk about it. In 2006, Governor Symington agrees to be interviewed for James's documentary, Beyond the Blue, and drops a bombshell on camera. Yes, a lot of people saw it in Maricopa County, and I saw it too. Symington, a pilot and retired Air Force officer, admits that he himself saw the boomerang-shaped craft. Fife, uh, can you describe what exactly you saw on March 13, 1997? I've described it as a delta-shaped craft, uh, but it was a large, uh, dark object, and it was enormous. It was so big, it was hard to really determine how fast it was going because it was so large. It was very, uh, very odd, the whole thing. It was kind of had an iridescent quality to it, and it was just astounding. I mean, uh, much bigger than anything I'd ever seen in the air. I realized that I was seeing something that was truly extraordinary. Five. Why did you decide to come forward? And I figured, well, enough time has passed, and I can see that there are a bunch of people that are really angry with me for what I did, so this is really an opportunity right now to set the record straight. I'm no longer governor, and I'm just a Joe citizen, and, and I just uh, I don't want uh, people to be, uh, who are my constituents, to be upset with me for something that, really, I'm, I'm on, on the same page. Yeah. In your opinion, as, as an Air Force officer, as a pilot, do you think that, these, that this craft you saw was military? Do you think the craft you saw might have been extraterrestrial or something along those lines? Uh, I, I've used the, the word before to describe what I saw as being otherworldly. I just don't believe that it came from, from anything that we know, um, you know, on Earth. So you call it extraterrestrial, uh, otherworldly. It was an incredible thing to see. And, uh, and I'm, I, I just don't know of any earthly explanation for what we saw. my opinion, we're looking at some kind of extraterrestrial craft that passed over the city. Multiple eyewitnesses agree on that, including the governor of Arizona himself, who said that this thing was from another world. I can't imagine that hundreds of people across Phoenix would be so fooled. It really does leave me wondering, could this have been something more? I think it's a real craft. I don't think it's an illusion. I think it's a craft that has amazing aerodynamic qualities. I think it's a solid craft, but I think it is our own neutral buoyancy triangular spacecraft. Tests have shown the lights captured on video on March 13, 1997, behave unlike conventional flares. And witnesses across the state remain convinced that they saw something extraordinary. Was the state of Arizona a testing ground for a new and still secret technology? or were the witnesses on the ground truly seeing an object from beyond this world? Hidden away in an underground archive are row upon row of files few have seen. The life's work of history's greatest UFO hunter. 
and they may contain proof that we are not alone. In 1957, America's most advanced aircraft is followed by something that had the power to disappear. Well, in 1957, you don't have an aircraft that can jump from 11 o'clock to 2 o'clock instantaneously. A landing in the desert turns sand to glass and leaves behind other physical traces. These weren't just random holes in the ground. This was an engineered craft. Who came out to investigate this? FBI. And the most sought after photographs in UFO history. And these photos have become the holy grail of ufology. Corroborating reports, strange marks in the desert, and a picture too perfect to be a hoax. It's a perfect <laughs> match. This is case number 54103, The Lost UFO Files. In 1954, the Arizona desert outside of Tucson. Near sunset, James E. McDonald, a senior physicist at the University of Arizona, is driving through the expanse of desert with four meteorologists. Off in the distance, McDonald notices a strange point of light hovering above the mountains. The bright anomalous object appears to be made of aluminum. He points it out to his colleagues but none of the men are able to identify it. It disappears without much of a reaction. Little do these men know, but this mysterious sighting has just changed the course of UFO history. James McDonald became fascinated with the controversy over UFO studies. And the more his fascination grew, the more he realized that these cases had to be investigated. Over the next 16 years, McDonald interviews over 500 witnesses, uncovers important government documents, and gives presentations of UFO evidence to huge crowds across the country. He was the first man to take hard science into the UFO phenomenon and bring it into the scientific community. Today, McDonald's legacy lives on in the archives of the University of Arizona, an untapped resource of UFO investigation and evidence. There's a massive amount of material here. The collection is extensive, very meticulously uh, detailed handwritten notes. So we've got film, video, physical artifacts. There could be some pretty interesting information here. With special access to his archived files, UFO Hunters aims to piece together the investigations of James McDonald by bringing classic case files into the 21st century. UFO Hunters meet with archivist Scott Cossel, who escorts them into the vault. All right, so here we are now. This is the archive of the University of Arizona Special Collections. The James McDonald papers run from here all the way down that way. This is a restricted area. Okay. Happy hunting. Wow. Bill Burns will reopen one of the most controversial cases in UFO history, the 1965 Heflin photographs, and put them through vigorous tests and visual analysis. These four images have become the holy grail of ufology. If they're real, they're the best pictures of a UFO we have anywhere. Dr. Ted Ackworth will dig into the RB47 UFO sightings of 1957, when a UFO reportedly pursues an Air Force crew for over 90 minutes and 700 miles. One of McDonald's most compelling cases, the incident includes three verifiable sources, the pilot, a ground radar station, and the plane's state-of-the-art electronic countermeasure technology. 
did all three see a UFO with staggering capabilities? This one looks pretty good because it's not just witness testimony, but if we can uncover more technical data about the radar, and it wasn't just the radar systems on board the aircraft, but also the radar on the ground. There were active radar installations that actually picked up the UFO at the same time. So maybe through this research here, maybe we dig up something new. Pat Uskert is looking closer at the 1964 sightings of a strange craft by Lonnie Zamora, a police officer in Socorro, New Mexico. The case involves a shiny capsule-like craft that blasts off, leaving hard evidence behind. Now, in the Zamora file, there were sketches, there were photographs, and his testimony. What I'd like to do is, using our more modern techniques and tools that we have today, is uh, pick up where McDonald left off and see what actually happened that day to Lonnie Zamora. After all these years, this has never really been resolved. The files are the culmination of 17 years of work by McDonald. He began assembling them in 1953 while a professor at the University of Arizona. Within McDonald's files, cases originally conducted by Project Blue Book are reopened. His research uncovers some of the first proof that the CIA was investigating UFOs. His documents revealed the possibility that the Air Defense Command, Air Force Intelligence, and even the Strategic Air Command were involved in UFO incidents. His conclusion? The public is being deceived. You can't do any research into the work of James McDonald without examining the Heflin case. McDonald was fascinated by the Heflin case. In fact, he couldn't let it go. August 3rd, 1965, Santa Ana, California, approximately 12.30 p.m. Traffic investigator Rex Heflin is about to take a picture of a tree branch that is obscuring a road sign. But out of the corner of his eye, he witnesses something fascinating. A saucer-shaped craft moving across the horizon just 150 feet above the ground. According to Heflin, he snaps these three pictures with his Polaroid 101 instant camera. As the object travels left to right across the road, the first, taken through the front windshield, clearly shows a saucer-shaped object that appears to be off in the distance flying above the ground. The second seems to show the same disc as taken through the side window of Heflin's truck. In the third picture, the object seems to be smaller as if traveling away from the camera. Within two minutes, the alleged saucer disappears, but leaves behind a peculiar smoke ring in the sky. James McDonald wasn't the only person fascinated by the Rex Heflin case. The Air Force investigated it, Project Blue Book investigated it, and also the Condon Committee investigated this case. All of those groups dismissed the case as a hoax. Project Blue Book was the Air Force's official program studying UFO phenomenon until 1968, when the Condon Committee, headed by physicist Edward Condon, determined that UFO research was unlikely to yield any serious results. Blue Book was abandoned two years later, in 1970, but James McDonald believed Condon's conclusions were highly flawed and showed a blatant disregard for the high number of unexplained incidents. Bill's investigation begins with Ann Druffel, who not only maintains copies of the Heflin photographs, but is also James McDonald's biographer. And these photos have become almost like the holy grail of ufology. It did, but you see, Rex Heflin didn't think anything of it. He had lent them first to two military sources that wanted to analyze them, and both of these sources returned them. But then, according to McDonald's files, Heflin states that two men claiming to be from NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, asked to borrow the photos. Now, Rex Heflin was used to working with official sources because of his job. So he gave them the photos, expecting that they would be returned within a few days, but they never were. And all we had left were second generation copies. After Heflin claims his originals are not returned, the U.S. Air Force officially labels them a photographic hoax. 
With only copies to analyze, some debunkers claim to see a line just above the UFO, indicating some type of wire or connection to the object. Others disagree, saying these are defects or alterations seen only in the copies. Without the original photos, there is no way to be sure. So suddenly other copies of the photos began to spread through parts of the community, the UFO yes, community. Yes, of course, they had been altered. So if one were paranoid, one would say there was some kind of a disinformation thing going on with various copies of the photos that kept turning up. Some believe that the originals were taken for precisely this reason. And then, almost 20 years later, something miraculous happens. One day, his phone rang, and a woman's voice said, have you checked your mailbox lately? And Rex was puzzled. But he went out, and he saw an envelope there. He opened it, and there were the three original photos that the so-called NORAD men had borrowed 20 years before or so. Today, Anne Druffel is the closest source for getting to the original photographs taken by Heflin, and she gives Bill copies of the photos for further analysis. Heflin died in 2005 and never wavered from his story that he photographed an actual object, albeit an unusual object. The question remains today, did he hoax the photo or was it a real object? Will the wire or line appear in the original copies? Closer analysis and crucial data from McDonald's files may reveal if these are really photos of a flying saucer. It's a perfect <laughs> match. After his death in 1971, physicist James McDonald left behind an amazing array of files, precise notes, photos, audio files, and other evidence meticulously collected over years of research into UFO phenomenon. UFO Hunters has selected three of the most intriguing cases to follow up with new investigations. April 24, 1964, 5.45 p.m. Officer Lonnie Zamora of the Socorro, New Mexico Police Department is pursuing a black Chevrolet speeding down Old Rodeo Street when he hears a loud roar and sees a bluish flame to the southwest. Zamora abandons pursuit of the vehicle and radios that he is investigating a possible explosion. As he nears the spot, he expects to see an accident. Instead, he sees something entirely different, a shiny metallic object that has landed to the side of the road in the desert. He estimates it is approximately 30 feet wide, the size of a small RV today. He also claims the egg-shaped craft has four landing supports at its base. Suddenly, the object lifts off with the same bluish flame traveling to the southeast. It disappears within minutes. Pat is in Socorro, New Mexico, hoping to find new leads based on James McDonald's file. It's really hard to emphasize how significant the Lonnie Zamora case is. It's been a part of every major UFO report since Project Blue Book. So this case has never been solved, and that's why we have to look at it. Local historian and reporter Paul Harden recently covered Zamora's sighting in the El Defensor Chieftain newspaper. And after more than 40 years, he found that Zamora's story still has legs. Can you tell me why people are still talking about this incident 40 years after it happened? That's a good question. I was kind of surprised myself. I, I do a lot of history articles, never UFO articles before. You don't consider yourself a, a ufologist? No, not really. <laughs> I was really surprised at how many people in town actually remembered it or were involved in it. And so it got kind of interesting. So from a historical point of view, this is, this is real history. This really happened. No doubt in my mind that the incident happened. The only thing that history can't tell you is, you know, what did Mr. Zamora see? I can't answer that. Zamora's account is one of the most specific UFO sightings ever recorded. According to McDonald's Zamora file, 
Not only did he provide descriptions of the object's size, appearance, speed, and behavior, but reports described marks left in the sand by the object, as well as fused sand and scorched brush. Numerous witnesses to these strange physical traces are on scene within minutes after the sighting. So immediately you have a fair number of law enforcement agents that were at the scene 10 minutes or so after Lonnie saw it. When you say at the scene, you mean they went to the landing site? They went to the actual landing site. Okay, yes. and so these were law officers that could confirm that there were landing impressions in the dirt Correct. and uh, that there were burned bushes. Uh, well, as a matter area. of fact, in the original Defense Chieftain's story, they cite how when they arrived at the scene, the plants were still smoldering. Wow. So, you know, it tells you something happened. Many people have looked into the Zamora sighting, but few have come up with any solid conclusions. Some believe this is because Zamora has remained silent for over a decade. But Pat is on his way to hear the story firsthand. Lonnie Zamora has agreed to break his silence. As Pat heads out into the desert, Ted travels to Castle Air Museum in Atwater, California to meet with aviation expert Bill Scott. The two are looking into James McDonald's file on the sighting of a UFO trailing a state-of-the-art RB-47 in 1957. Now, Professor McDonald was really interested in this case uh, because he felt there was an awful lot of technology involved which was giving up you know, serious hard evidence. It was our most sophisticated listening technology on the planet, really. The RB-47E was the reconnaissance backbone of the U.S. Air Force during the 1950s. It was specifically outfitted not to carry weaponry, but highly sensitive ELINT, or electronic intelligence technology, used to intercept radar signals. Its job, with all its electronic gear on board, would be to fly along the border of the Soviet Union, for instance, and listen for the Russian radars that were transmitting. In the 1950s, when this aircraft was launched, it was our most sophisticated radar listening equipment in the world, right? That's exactly right. 1950s technology, of course, but that was a state of the art. It was critical to our national security, so of course we had the best electronic gear that was available. But the U.S. Air Force's best available technology would soon encounter something beyond its own capabilities. July 17, 1957, just after 4 a.m., an RB-47 with a six-man crew is on a routine training mission over the Gulf of Mexico, near the town of Gulfport, Mississippi. On the number two monitor, one of the officers detects a signal moving rapidly. For the next 90 minutes and 700 miles, the aircraft's ELIT, ground radar installations, and even the Air Force pilots themselves will observe a strange object tracking one of the Air Force's most important aircraft. This crew was on their way back from a training mission, all six of them aboard, three of whom were the ELINT operators. This is the end of their training. They were about to ship out. So they're probably at the height of their expertise, just finishing up an extensive training program in the States before deployment. At the time, this was our front line fighting force, a strategic air command. So these ELAN operators would have been very well trained because literally the fate of the country were in their hands and the pilots that flew these airplanes. Right. How about the ELINT equipment? How long had that been out? Is there any chance that this equipment was malfunctioning or it's such a brand new technology that there's some question there or was this tried and true hardware? I would say it's probably tried and true hardware of the time. Yeah. So it was cutting edge, very well maintained. According to James McDonald's report, despite this being the most advanced equipment in service, the officer who first spots the object on the ELID thinks the equipment is malfunctioning. They had one of the other operators mm -hmm. that double checked it, tried it on another monitor, which would use a different set of antennas right. on the RB-47. They established very early on that the equipment was working fine, everything was perfect. But the rest of the crew is about to get an up-close and personal view of whatever is appearing on their scope. As the RB-47 approaches Jackson, Mississippi for the second part of its exercise, one of the pilots spots what he first thinks are landing lights of another jet coming in fast 
As the single bluish-white light closes rapidly, he alerts the rest of the crew to be ready for sudden evasive maneuvers. But before he can attempt anything, both he and his co-pilot see the light instantaneously change directions and flash across their flight path. Then it blinks out. In these rare recordings from the files, James McDonald is heard conducting an interview with a pilot who encountered the object, Colonel Lewis D. Chase. I'm looking at it as a pilot at night now, seeing a light source that I interpret as an airplane. But then suddenly it's by in front of me so fast that I couldn't respond. Did it uh, simply blink out, or did it take off at uh, appreciable angular velocity? No, just gone. Just, just disappeared? Just blinked out. Yeah. It's quite a... Uh, Quite an interceptor you were trying there. <laughs> that, that is really, really strange. Now, these were trained aircraft pilots. These are United States Air Force officers. These guys know what aircraft look like. Nothing in the U.S. military arsenal has the ability to simply blink out. In the report, the pilot, a 20-year veteran, claims the object moved at a velocity, quote, he'd never seen matched in his flight experience. And for them to be really shocked about something they saw visibly uh, says a lot. So now you add to that, that in, a, in addition to the visible sighting, we had, you know, this aircraft, the technology back here in the bay uh, was, was our most sophisticated listening system for, for listening to radar. With no surviving images from the flight's ELINT, Ted turns to the testimony in McDonald's files to verify the object's incredible maneuvers. And Bill zeroes in on Rex Heflin's photographs with a field test putting the hoax theory on the line. James McDonald's files are offering up intriguing leads on some of the top UFO cases ever recorded. From Lonnie Zamora's strange encounter in the desert to highly trained RB-47 pilots being buzzed by objects they cannot describe. But perhaps the most well-known case involves these photos. Four images of a saucer-shaped object taken in 1965 by Rex Heflin in Santa Ana, California. Many have claimed that the photos are a hoax. One reason they cite is that Heflin could not have possibly shot three Polaroids in just 20 seconds with his old 1950s camera. But could he? Bill has brought in a senior scientist from Polaroid, Ted McClelland, to put this theory to the test. Was it possible for Rex Heflin to snap off three photos in 20 seconds using a Polaroid 101. Ted has brought an authentic Polaroid 101 camera. It is the exact same model Rex Heflin used in his everyday work and to take the infamous photos. The film very simply goes in to the back of the camera, close it up, and everything is light tight, raise the viewfinder and hit the shutter button and pull the frames out and, and I'll demonstrate that. So you're not waiting for the film to actually process inside the back of the camera. You just take the whole pack right out as soon as you're done with the photo? You take the fr frame out as soon as you snap the shutter. Okay. Well, acid test. <laughs> Ready? Ready. Go. You're doing good. Seventeen seconds. Very good. But with one debunking point crossed off the list, there are still others that plague the Heflin evidence. Several claims have been made that the shots are too focused, suggesting a double exposure. A double exposure happens when two photos are taken on the same frame of film. If this was a hoax, Heflin could have taken one photo out of his window of the sky and then taken a second photo of a hubcap or similar object on the same film, 
making it appear as if the two images are one. So Ted, another really big issue in this whole Heflin controversy is this. Look at this shot. This looks like it's in focus, that looks like it's in focus, that looks like it's in focus. And these vaguely look like they're in focus, and this is in focus, the rearview mirror. So one of the issues is that these are somehow double exposures or hoax shots. Depending on the camera settings and the film stock, objects close to the lens or far in the distance can appear out of focus. Heflin's ability to capture a crisp foreground and background led many to question the validity of the photos. Using this camera, having it set on infinity with 3,000 ASA speed film, you would be in focus from three feet to infinity. Okay, so what you're saying is that that camera can keep all of these disparate objects, this, 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 and the line of the road going off into infinity here, in focus at the same time. Correct. Another point that plagued James McDonald was seen in Heflin's fourth and final photo. Heflin's last image appears to show a smoke ring that lingers after the craft flies away. The first three photos show what seems to be clear skies, but the fourth, supposedly taken only two minutes after the first three, shows clouds in the sky. So looking at these three photos taken from inside the car, in fact, you can't see any clouds in these photos, whether they're there or not. Gets out of the car, takes this, now suddenly clouds appear in the photo. So the question is, where are the clouds? This camera, the automatic exposure, is probably tricked by the darkness within the van and in setting the exposure closer to that. The outside photo, the last one, is nothing to interfere with the auto exposure, and it's picking up exactly what it sees. So let me get this straight. Here, it's getting darkness from inside the truck. Correct. Overexposes this. Correct. Therefore, totally white sky against a totally black background. But here, he's outside. So the automatic exposure only takes what it sees from the light that's coming in the lens. Nothing interferes with it. It takes exactly what it sees, i.e. the clouds. Correct. That mystery solved. While some of the major debunking points have been dismissed, the harshest one of all is that the object itself is a fake. Project Blue Book labeled the photos as a hoax, calculating that the object was only nine inches in diameter, 12 feet off the ground, and about 15 to 20 feet in the distance. There is no hoax that I saw pulling up negatives of this, magnifying this as best I could. I saw no signs of a hoax. So no strings, no piano wire? Nothing like that. Yet the strongest proof that this is a true UFO may lie in calculations by James McDonald himself. But Pat is still in search of something solid on the Lonnie Zamora file. I'm here at the police station here in Socorro, New Mexico, where I'm going to meet the chief of police, Lawrence Romero. Lawrence has agreed to take Pat to meet Lonnie Zamora at the landing site. Pat is hoping to get a clearer picture of Zamora's sighting and revisit some of James McDonald's lingering questions. So what is your opinion of Lonnie? Lonnie is a very upfront type guy, excellent police officer. He's a pillar of his church also. So you don't doubt his story at all? No. So are we close to this site now? Yes, we are. We're, uh, we're about 400 feet, 500 feet. By finally meeting Lonnie Zamora, the key witness in the case, Pat aims to dig deeper into one of McDonald's strangest cases. What touched down in the desert outside of Zacora, New Mexico on that cold spring day? This is one of the original indentations. Pat is in Socorro, New Mexico, and has come to meet with Lonnie Zamora, the subject of one of James McDonald's top UFO cases. Zamora hasn't talked about his 1964 encounter in the desert in over a decade, 
But after years of scrutiny, Lonnie hopes that he can help prove what he saw was not a hoax. So what did you see from this vantage point? Uh, from here up to see down on top of it, sort of an egg-shaped object. Oh, I'll say about 30 to 40 feet uh, wide. I didn't know what it was until I started moving towards it. I realized it was something that I had never seen before. So I thought maybe it would, it would be some some kind of Air Force experiment, you know, mm -hmm. at the first. So at first you thought maybe yeah. th this was a, a military aircraft of some sort? Yeah, something like that. No. Well, it was investigated, and they found out that there was no such aircraft. Yeah, there was no, nothing here, no. The odd shape and structure of the object Lonnie describes is similar to the lunar module. In fact, Air Force investigators initially theorized that this might be a test of this top secret vehicle. But further analysis quickly proved this theory wrong. A flyable working model of the lunar module was not ready until 1965, a full year after Zamora's sighting. But whatever landed here, left evidence behind. Now you're saying there were actual indentations from the craft down here. Yes, the crafts were around there. And uh, there's uh, one indentation right there. This is one of the original yeah. indentations? Yeah, right there. OK, so one of them is there. another one over there. OK. Where the rock is. And I had one over there and one over here. So it was four. So right after the craft lifted off, these indentations were fresh. Right, right, real fresh. The indentations are not the only physical traces the craft leaves. According to Lonnie, bushes burn and rocks smolder at the landing site. So Lonnie, where were these bushes exactly? Well, that was a big one right there, and one right there, and one right up here. And they were all burning. This was the one that's burning more, you know. You couldn't get near it. It's, it's, it was just burning. Do you think this fire here was directly related to the object you saw? Yeah, when it took off, yeah. But this evidence is quickly confiscated by Air Force investigators, who arrive soon after Lonnie does. And McDonald reveals it wasn't the Air Force that asked for this debris to be collected and taken away. It was the FBI. Adding to the mystery, the files reveal that the FBI didn't want anyone to know they were working on the case. The reason is never fully revealed. They were excited about it, you know, tried to ask questions, but uh, they wouldn't let me answer any questions. Just keep it quiet for a while. Air Force told you to keep this quiet for a while. James McDonald was interested in breaking that silence and doggedly tracked down specialists who had been brought in by the government to investigate Lonnie's sighting. His files indicate one expert, a Mary Mays from the University of New Mexico, was enlisted to analyze plant material. In an interview with McDonald, Mays described the location and reported seeing a 25 to 30 inch patch of fused sand at the landing site. According to her, a small area of desert had turned to glass. One test may shed additional light on Lonnie's story. In hopes of adding to McDonald's investigation, Pat aims to find out just how much energy it would take to melt the sand from the site of Zamora's encounter. I'm meeting Patrick Morrissey, a glass blower with 30 years of experience, who's going to tell me exactly how sand fuses into glass. And I've specifically brought sand from the Socorro landing site, where Lonnie Zamora saw the craft land. Now, you know that there are various theories about what happened. One of them is that something landed and fused the sand from incredibly high temperatures. Another theory is that they may be hoaxers somehow fused the sand. So what I'd like to know from you is, what does it take to fuse sand into glass? 
First, we're gonna have to do is we're gonna take it off of here. We're gonna use this plate right here. Okay. And then we're gonna put them into our glass glory hole over here and see if we can melt it. So Patrick, while this is heating up, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Let's say these hoaxers came out with some equipment, let's say a blowtorch. Right. Could that work? If a hoaxer brought out a blowtorch and, and tried to fuse sand, it's a pretty good plane. But that would not really melt any glass at all. It's just not hot enough. So basically you're saying you need an oven. An oven. To melt glass. That's right. I think I see the sand changing color. It's starting to bond a little bit. Now, don't let that bond fool you. It's not glass, <laughs> not yet anyway. After nearly 25 minutes, the sand sample from the Zamora site is ready to be examined. It's kind of hot. About how hot? Oh, right now it's definitely at least 2,100 degrees. So 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit is sufficient to melt sand. 2,100 degrees is hot enough to melt the sand that you brought to me. So now, according to our reports, there was a huge patch of fused glass at the, at the landing site. OK. So you're saying it takes 2,100 degrees to, to create 25 this. 25 minutes yeah. to melt that little piece. Right. Right. So the hoaxer scenario? It is kind of hard to believe. It takes over 2,100 degrees and some duration of time to melt sand, maybe over 20 to 25 minutes to melt the sand. So in Patrick's professional opinion, the hoaxer scenario is unlikely. Pat's finding adds great validity to Lonnie Zamora's story. Meanwhile, Ted continues his investigation into James McDonald's RB-47 case. What happens when the most sophisticated aircraft in the U.S. arsenal is upstaged by something far more advanced? 1957, you don't have an aircraft that can jump from 11 o'clock to 2 o'clock instantaneously and then just blink out. James McDonald's files have provided new grounds for investigation for both Rex Heflin's photos and Lonnie Zamora's sightings in the desert. But with no radar records or eyewitnesses from 1957, little is known about the RB-47 encounter, where an object pursued a state-of-the-art Air Force jet for over 90 minutes and 700 miles. With this in mind, Ted and Bill Scott have plotted the course of the aircraft in hopes of understanding the strange events on that summer morning. So the aircraft turns west. And that's when the pilot has a visual sighting right out of the cockpit. And then what do they do over this course here before Dallas? That's when they're actually trying to evade the object. They started accelerating and decelerating right. to see if they could lose the object. Mm -hmm. And it always stayed right with them all the time. Now, at this point, the pilot contacts Duncanville with their ground-based radar. Not only does Duncanville confirm they can see the UFO, but they can also see the aircraft. One of the things that fascinates me in this particular incident is that when the pilots reported that the bright light disappeared, mm -hmm. the ground-based radar at Duncanville said they lost the object, and the ELAN operator said he lost the object as well. Right. So they all three disappeared at the same time, and when it reappears, all three of them see it again. All three are agreeing on the progression of the case, the visual of the pilots, the RB-47's ELAN technology, and most amazingly, the radar on the ground as well. Everything is transpiring at the same time. Now, at this point, our pilot has received permission to deviate from his course back to base, and now he's basically going after the object, right? That's right. The object is at a lower altitude, so the pilot of the RB-47 dies towards mm -hmm. the object, and all of a sudden, the object stops, and they overshoot it. So at that time, the crew starts a left-hand turn to get back to where it can see the object. Unfortunately, at this point, they're running low on fuel, right? That's right. And that's when they decide to break off and head back for home. That's right. So then they took off to the north, mm -hmm. headed back towards Forbes Air Force Base, Kansas, right. and the object tends to stay with them. Right, stayed back, stayed with them almost halfway home. All the way back to Oklahoma City. Then Oklahoma City, it disappears. After 90 minutes, the intense chase leaves the pilots and the ground-based radar operators dumbfounded. None of them have an explanation for what has just occurred. When you string together the various descriptions of the flight maneuvers of this object, would you say that these are explainable through conventional aircraft? Well, in 1957, you don't have an aircraft that can just blink out, both in the 
the electromagnetic spectrum as well as the visual spectrum. And I would say we don't have anything like that now. Despite the overwhelming evidence and testimony, Project Blue Book dismissed the sighting quickly as the near collision of two DC-6 American airliners near Salt Flat, Texas. They give no details or rationale for this explanation, except for the following statement. Quote, it was definitely established by the CAA that object observed in the vicinity of Dallas and Fort Worth was an airliner. Blue Book's conclusion is highly unlikely. The RB-47's flight path didn't come within 400 miles of Salt Flat, Texas. McDonald used this quote in his report to demonstrate Blue Book's poor methods of investigation. Yet the case is now carried in the official Blue Book files as identified. I feel like there must have been something out there, something going on. It sure looks like something was there. What it is, I don't think we know, and here it is 50 years later, we still don't know. The answers to the RB-47 case will never be fully known, but the investigation can be sure of one thing. James McDonald never agreed with Blue Book's findings, and for him, the case remained unidentified. But there's one last hoax claim left to be tested. Rex Heflin's photographs. Heflin claimed the object he photographed was roughly 20 feet in diameter and about an eighth of a mile from his truck. Project Blue Book said the object was small, like a hubcap, and close to the camera. Bill has brought in Ted and image analyst expert Terrence Masson to give the photos a closer look. Blue Book said it was a total hoax, that the object was no more than nine inches in diameter, that it was maybe 12 feet off the ground, maybe 15 to 20 feet in the distance. But Heflin's account varies greatly. He describes a specific object 20 feet in diameter and 700 feet away. Using these specific numbers, Terence has constructed a 3D landscape to test Heflin's claims. He places a 20-foot diameter saucer 700 feet in the distance, matching the description given by Heflin after the incident. If Heflin had hoaxed the photos and simply made up numbers regarding the size and distance of the object, there will be almost no chance of the 3D model matching the photos. If he was telling the truth, if he made an accurate estimation to his eyeball, that object in our simulation has to line up. Here's a 20-foot diameter object, mm -hmm. 150 feet off the ground. Let's slide it along. Mm -hmm. We'll fade up our image and put our object Whoa. at about 700 Rest feet. Down. Amazing. So that's better than close. Better than close? It's a perfect <laughs> match. This is just very simple trigonometry. You just put it in the space that's very accurate at the size of the object and the height of the object that Heflin said it was. They match very, very precisely. So you've eliminated somebody throwing some stupid thing in the air like a hubcap. You've knocked that out because that couldn't come up this way. The investigation's theory is now that Heflin must have been observing something not under his control, and that he himself was not hoaxing it. In my estimation, James McDonald did a really good job collecting relevant evidence for this case. They didn't have a lot of computational power back then. Digital image processing was a brand new technology. We've enhanced what McDonald said because we had these tools at our disposal and therefore could definitively show by the mathematics of that computer simulation that Heflin was right. Given today's extraordinary leaps forward in technology and scientific analysis, James McDonald's investigation into UFO phenomena would only have gotten stronger. But tragically, he committed suicide in 1971 his personal life unraveling as he pushed forward with his scientific studies of UFOs. Now, his legacy and his tireless work live on, with other cases awaiting new investigations and more answers still waiting to be discovered. In the summer of 2008, the United Kingdom is under siege. Over three months, nearly 200 UFO sightings sweep across Great Britain. 
how big it was. If it had come nearer, I just don't know. A huge triangular object, like one seen over the United States. I've never seen anything like it. And new images surface. In one, an unknown object in close proximity to a tornado. This is probably the best photographic evidence I've seen yet. In another, something bizarre is photographed tumbling through the air. And strangest of all, a police helicopter hotly pursues an unknown craft. Police claimed that the helicopter chased the UFO. Could there be a reason for this sudden UFO escalation? The object accelerated 10 times as fast as a military jet. And is the British government hiding something? This is case number 52004, UFO Storm. object was, I would say, uh, between 100 and 120 feet. It was a, a round shape, a sphere, and it was rotating. And I said, am I going crackers? Can anybody see this? Summer 2008. In countless cities across the United Kingdom, accounts of strange lights, unexplained objects, and other bizarre phenomena attract the world's attention. Record-breaking numbers of reports dominate front-page headlines and nightly news broadcasts. In Liverpool, 13 strange orbs. In Ramsgate, a giant flying triangle. In Bristol, a hovering silver object. In Birmingham, three low-flying disks. An epidemic of UFO sightings covers the British map. By the end of August, nearly 200 sightings have been reported, and the numbers are increasing. We've landed here in the United Kingdom because currently, England is the world's hotspot for UFO sightings. As UFO investigators, this is exactly where we want to be, where the phenomenon is the most active. What we're getting is videographic and photographic evidence of of orbs, of triangles, even one case related to meteorological phenomena. Bill Burns will look into a breaking case involving a police helicopter that nearly collides with a UFO and then gives chase to the object. There were conflicts. The police denied it, the Ministry of Defense denied it, but witnesses said it really happened. Pat Uskert will uncover never-before-seen video of an object that may have ties to an American mass sighting. He's pretty impressed by what he saw that night, and he thinks he, he's looking at some kind of UFO event. And Dr. Ted Ackworth will hunt down and analyze compelling pictures which seem to show a UFO approaching a tornado. The object was very, very close near this twister. Are those related? Is there some cause and effect? I'm not sure, but I'd like to find out. This epidemic of UFOs has happened before, across the Atlantic. June 1952. Throughout the United States, an alarmingly high number of UFO sightings sweep from coast to coast. The following months come to be known as the Summer of the Saucers. The sightings seem to peak when two Pan Am pilots spot six glowing red disks while flying over Newport News, Virginia, on the night of July 14th. But just days later, on July 19th, the wave reaches a breaking point. In the skies over Washington, D.C., air traffic controllers at Washington National Airport track several objects flying over the White House. But the objects vanish before Air Force jets can scramble. Now, there is a new summer of the saucers. This thing was just motionless. It just stayed there. And every now and then, it would flash. I didn't believe in, in extraterrestrial life and, and until I saw this, this UFO. 
whatever is happening in the United Kingdom has left many residents rushing to record their encounters as proof that something is going on. I'm about to meet with Steve Tuzer, who witnessed some strange lights at the height of this UFO wave. He's got some interesting video, and we're gonna check it out. May 10th, 2008, University of Wales student Steve Tuzer is walking back to his dorm after a late night soccer game. But his night is about to get a lot more exciting. Well, it was on May the 10th, about 11, between 11 and 12 at midnight, and I happened to have my handheld camera. I looked straight into the sky and I saw these strange lights, and they started doing these strange formations, like triangular formations, and they were like bundled together, and it was just, I've never seen anything like it. So I quickly got my camera and filmed it all. Steve's video shows the unexplained formation of lights moving from west to east through the night sky. As they move, however, a fourth light appears. What you were looking at in your viewfinder, could you also see that with your naked eye? No, it was, it was far away because I couldn't really zoom that close into them with my camera, so they were very far away. What was their trajectory? Most of them went across the sky. Did they uh, exhibit a sort of independent movement? Yeah, it's like they were, it's like they were like together talking to each other or something. I don't know, just doing something. And there's different formations, and then they would just disappear. I have to say, the footage is very interesting. Uh, we are looking at lights in a formation that are hovering over the town. Now, uh, because of the distance and the uh, the quality of the camera, I can't really know what what these lights were. But uh, that's why we're going to have it sent to the lab and have Ted analyze the footage and, and, and see what he can make of it. Steve Tuzer isn't the only person perplexed by strange objects in the British skies in the coming months. July 28th, in Barry, 160 miles west of London, retired professional photographer Roger Williams is relaxing in his backyard when he notices something flashing in the afternoon sky just above the roof of his house. What I actually saw was um, some flashing in the sky, bright flashing. My first thought that was, it was a, an aircraft tumbling. But then Roger notices the object is not losing altitude. The saucer-shaped metal object appears to be spinning in place. So you saw the object up here, and what happened next? Well, I thought um, after I watched it for a short while, I decided to go upstairs to get my camera. Roger snaps these pictures from his bedroom window. He photographs a silver-colored object against a clear blue sky. The object is blurry, but visual processing should be able to enhance the image to get a better look. Roger also captures a passing airplane which provides an instant visual contrast that will be important in future analysis. I realized that there were no wings or anything like that. It was a, a sort of a donut shape with reflections around the edge. Uh, so obviously it wasn't a, a plane or anything like that. Roger has an unobstructed view while taking the photos. Right, so you had a good perspective right, right outside, and you weren't even shooting through glass. No, no, no glass, just straight through there. It's up in that direction. Yeah, and it looks like you were stabilizing your hand on the side of the window. That's right. Yeah. All right, well, those are great shooting conditions. After taking the pictures, Roger immediately loads them into his computer for a better look. H how many did you take all together? Well, it's basically about four or five shots. And you took those over the course of how, how much oh, time? just a couple of minutes. The similar focal planes of the object and the airplane flying nearby provide important visual information. So this is a really interesting question to me, is because in this frame that has both the aircraft and our object, they appear to be in relatively similar quality of focus. So they are probably at similar distances, but I think it really depends on what the settings were for the lens. From that, we should be able to get a sense of the depth of focus. By obtaining the lens settings and aperture from Roger, Ted can now conduct a complete photo analysis to see if he can identify this silvery tumbling object. I have to say this is probably the best photographic evidence I've seen yet.
but Steve Tuzer's and Roger Williams' sightings are just paving the way for the most controversial event of the summer. On June 7, 2008, just outside of the Welsh town of Cardiff, a police helicopter reportedly preparing to land at St. Athen Royal Air Force Base is nearly struck by a UFO. To many researchers and news agencies, this is Britain's most compelling UFO case in years. I'm meeting with British ufologist Andy Russell. Andy is a specialist in UFO sightings here in Wales. Bill meets with Andy at the perimeter of St. Athen Royal Air Force Base, the focal point of the entire encounter. The whole incident started here at RAF St. Athen early hours on the 8th of June, although some witnesses have seen a craft around the area on the 7th. When the helicopter was coming into land, the crew noticed a small UFO approaching it at a high speed. The crew took evasive action. Originally, South Wales police claimed that the helicopter chased the UFO. We've got witnesses in Cardiff and St. Malins and a few other areas that have witnessed that chase. Later, South Wales police have retracted that statement and said that the chase never took place. Why would the police change their story? Bill has tracked down a lead that may prove the authorities are involved in a cover-up. We found a commercial pilot who was in that airspace that night, he was approaching Cardiff Airport, and the tower radioed him and said, be advised, a police helicopter is tracking a UFO in your airspace. One pilot's confession may help prove the authorities gave chase to a UFO. What were the police following? And were they trying to keep up with technology well beyond their own? The object accelerated 10 times as fast as a military jet. In the summer of 2008, the United Kingdom has become a center for frenetic UFO activity. Reports, pictures, and videos have been captured all over the country. But nowhere has a case intrigued more people than the Welsh city of Cardiff, where a police helicopter reportedly was in a near collision with a UFO and gave pursuit near St. Athen Royal Air Force Base in the early morning hours of June 7th. At least one pilot reported he was told by air traffic control that a UFO had encountered a helicopter in his airspace, stay away. UFO hunters are in the UK to investigate the events taking place in the summer of 2008. They are working with local news agencies to locate credible eyewitnesses. With no video or pictures known to exist, the Cardiff helicopter incident is at the top of the investigation's most wanted list. Bill Burns is contacted by a pilot who says he was in the skies the night of the incident and he was alerted by air traffic control to the situation. Today I'm meeting with the commercial airline pilot who was warned out of Cardiff Airport airspace by the tower because they said they were tracking a UFO and a police helicopter. But after several hours, the pilot doesn't show for his scheduled interview. Originally, he agreed to talk with us and tell us the entire story. Then he abruptly canceled. He won't return our phone calls. His initial emails show he is eager to participate. But after the missed interview, a final email shows he has changed his mind about discussing the case and won't say why. With the pilot now out of the picture, the investigation needs to locate more eyewitnesses. Pat meets with Andrew Dagnall, a reporter from Media Wales. Andrew has also experienced eyewitnesses going suddenly quiet, 
for him, it happened after speaking with sources inside the police department about the helicopter chase. A policeman was driving a helicopter so that he saw what he said was a UFO and chased this UFO out across the east into the Bristol Channel where it then disappeared. So how did you come by this information? The police actually reported this to us and that's what made it so significant was that it was actually coming firsthand from the authorities. Andrew Dagnall's police sources confirmed that one of their helicopters chased a UFO. But later, authorities offered up a contrary statement. According to the South Wales Police Department, quote, there were a variety of aircrafts of different shapes and sizes. In all probability, this sighting has just confirmed that one of these was in the area at the relevant time. The helicopter did not follow it or chase it across the Bristol Channel. Have you been able to get in touch with, uh, with the police officers that were involved in this incident? We've never actually been able to speak to him. That makes it difficult for us to pursue as a story because, you know, we're getting nothing back now from the police. This seems to be very common with these sightings. Something big happens, and then they attempt to uh, uh, cover it up, basically. I, I think we're on to something, that, that something really did happen over Cardiff involving what appears to be a genuine UFO. Bill is now seeking connections between the various events taking place this summer. To further understand what may be going on, he is meeting with Nick Pope, a former Ministry of Defense investigator who was assigned to UFO cases by the British government. So we have a video that someone shot of an object over South Wales, and I'd like you to take a look at it and see if you think this resembles anything like the descriptions that you've received. I mean, it's a fascinating piece of footage. It's interesting. Many of the Cosford witnesses talked about two lights, um, and it was, it was only later that some of them, particularly those who saw it really close, noticed a third and fainter light. But, but yeah, that is similar to what's been reported at Cosford. The Cosford incident took place on March 30th and 31st in 1993. It involved over 100 witnesses who saw two or three lights on what they believed was a triangular-shaped craft. The incident entangled two Royal Air Force bases, Cosford and Shawbury. What's at these bases that would interest some kind of other craft? Shawbury is somewhere where helicopter training is undertaken. Uh, Cosford is basically an engineering base. Uh, so it's a, it's a wide mixture of different establishments. These aren't just UFO sightings, however. These are craft that actually go over the base, they hover over the base, they linger over the base. More than that, in relation to the Cosford incident, one of the Air Force witnesses told me that um, the, the object accelerated away probably 10 times as fast as a military jet. It's not just lights in the sky. When it comes to sightings at military establishments, whatever this phenomenon is, does seem to be paying particular attention. We don't know what these things are, but they're in our airspace, and we want to know. Though it may be impossible to know why these sightings are happening, witnesses continue to be amazed at what they are seeing. Local media assistance has helped uncover an eyewitness who saw the Cardiff helicopter event on the night of June 7th. Sometime after midnight, Amanda Berry is in her kitchen, preparing to turn in for the evening, but soon realizes her night is just beginning. Well, I was basically, you know, sort of washing dishes, doing normal, you know, just usual things, working on my computer. Mm. Uh, you know, I looked out of the window and I basically saw this, this light, sort of a, a, an orangey sort of light. Amanda watches as a helicopter emerges behind the strange light. To her, it appears to be following or chasing the object. What drew your attention to this thing? What was unusual about it? Well, I mean, it was flying quite quickly, but it was sort of flying in a, in a very smooth way, which you wouldn't, I, I mean, in a sort of broad arc. 
According to Amanda, it is able to evade the helicopter with relative ease. Did it appear that this thing was moving faster than the helicopter? Yes, yes, it, it, it did. I was getting the impression that the helicopter was kind of struggling to keep up with it, and, and it seemed to be flying along quite effortlessly, really. I mean, it was almost like as if it was teasing the helicopter, you know? Amanda's description matches what many local media outlets reported hearing from other witnesses. But skeptics dismiss this sighting, claiming it is something far more prosaic, a simple paper balloon known as a Chinese fire lantern. Chinese fire lanterns are often used in celebrations such as weddings, birthdays, and concerts across the United Kingdom. In fact, fire lanterns were launched the night of the sighting at a wedding in the town of Cowbridge, only five miles from the St. Athen base. This Cardiff case, guys, is really perplexing. On the one hand, you've got the newspapers reporting this as a banner headline. The police admit that their helicopter encountered a UFO. Then the police pull back and say, oh no, nobody can talk to you. Well, it sounds like they're trying to downplay the incident, but according to some of the actual eyewitnesses, they reported that uh, they actually saw the helicopter chasing an object. The police gave this explanation that this was fire lanterns. I think we can probably devise some kind of experiment to either prove or disprove that theory. To put this theory to the test, Amanda has agreed to observe a series of fire lanterns and see if they appear anything like what she witnessed on the night of June 7th. With an eyewitness at the ready, the experiment is set for launch. Are police ignoring a case of simple misidentification? Or are they refusing to come forward because of a UFO incident at a Royal Air Force base? The investigation is in Cardiff, a Welsh city caught up in a wave of some of the United Kingdom's most compelling UFO cases in years. Video of what could be a huge craft. A strange picture of an object without wings tumbling in the afternoon sky. And a helicopter that reportedly pursued a UFO over the Bristol Channel on June 7, 2008. But official statements claim that this last incident is an overblown sighting of a Chinese fire lantern. These fire lanterns are candle-powered miniatures of hot air balloons, and they're frequently mistaken for UFOs. We have Amanda's testimony that she actually saw this thing. She saw a very strange object flying in a very peculiar fashion that was being chased by this helicopter, moving faster than the helicopter. Now, after this, this huge incident, there were reports that this was all the result of just Chinese fire lanterns. So we're here now to put that to the test. Amanda saw the object approximately 300 yards from her house. To accurately recreate her line of sight, Bill and Ted launch a fire lantern from a separate position 300 yards from Amanda and Pat. I'm down here at base one with Bill. He and I will be releasing it from here. Down this way at about 300 yards is base two. That's Pat and our witness. They're in position and ready to view our release of the lantern. What we really want is your opinion about does this thing look anything like the object that you saw on June 8th? Okay, we're going to light off the lantern, eyes in the sky. Go. Okay, we have liftoff. Copy that, we see it. Well, Amanda, well, it you looks, see it? Yeah. It does it look anything it, like it what you saw? It's a lot smaller than what I saw, and, and even at low altitude, they're small. So, well, even the lights on, on the helicopter I saw were, you know, I, they, they were dimmer than the, the lights on the other craft. You could see that they're, you know, electric lights. They were intense. These lights had intensity. Intense. Yeah, yeah. And this was more of a flickering candle or like a campfire. Yeah. 
basically it just didn't look the same at all, really, you know. I think you've made it clear that uh, this is completely different yeah. from what you saw that night. Yeah. Ted, I just wanted to let you know that we've pretty much concluded that uh, what we've launched here this evening uh, doesn't look anything like what Amanda saw that night. Okay, Pat, roger that. There is also meteorological evidence that casts doubt on the theory that these were fire lanterns launched from a wedding in the town of Cowbridge. Cowbridge is about 13 miles to the west of Cardiff. And the winds that night, we looked at the meteorological data, are coming basically out of the north. Now, if a fire lantern was launched over Cowbridge and, and climbed up to 2,000 feet, it would be traveling in this direction. And that is the opposite direction from Cardiff. So we've got a balloon that's launched 13 miles away, traveling basically away from Cardiff. How could that ever have been sighted over Cardiff? It, it just doesn't add up. So what does that mean? It's looking increasingly like we have to look for another explanation, and that explanation might very well be it's a UFO. While one experiment has helped eliminate a conventional explanation, the photos and video from Roger Williams and Steve Tuzer may provide even more evidence. Are these similar objects to what the helicopter pursued that night? Ted and image analyst Terence Masson look for any distinguishing characteristics in the evidence. Now, the, the Roger Williams photos, I'm really hopeful for. For once, we actually have a professional photographer taking a picture of an object. I'm hopeful that we can get something really definitive out of this. Roger turns his 35 millimeter camera skyward and captures six images of a strange disc-shaped object that he at first thinks is tumbling, but then realizes is hovering in place. If we could do a sequential viewing of, of each of, of the object zoomed in, and take out the motion, mm -hmm. uh, we could see how it looks over the course of those frames. What we did was several things. Able to isolate some motion blur out of it and do some sharpening and contrast enhancement and actually overlay and sequentially analyze those six photographs, one on top of another. To me, this is pretty wild. Yeah, it's, um, it's definitely changing shape. To me, it looks metallic. It, it looks very yeah, clearly reflective. silver, like an, like an aircraft body, aluminum skin, but nothing at all like the shape of an aircraft. And what we see very definitively is it's, it's roughly donut shaped, saucer shape, if you will. And it's very clearly over the course of that short minute and these six photographs that it's either tumbling or physically changing shape. It certainly shape. doesn't look like uh, any kind of wings or, or a helicopter. It no. definitely doesn't fit any of our uh, conventional aircraft profile. The fact that this metallic shiny object is hovering out there in space over the course of a minute and changing shape or rotating in place is very, very puzzling. But Steve Tuzer's footage shows something altogether different. The footage is remarkably similar to another incident that's already been closely analyzed. It reminds me a bit of the Tinley Park video in that there's that formation. On August 21st, 2004, hundreds in the small town of Tinley Park, Illinois, view three orange globes floating above their city. The video analysis seems to show that all three lights are connected. It does look like the, uh, the other two trailing points are locked to that third point. But most shocking is the size of the object. I think 1,500 is a pretty good estimate, plus or minus a couple few hundred feet. And I don't know any structure that you could fly that, would, no. that could hold lights 1,500 feet apart. Ted and Terrence believe the Tinley Park lights to be a massive single triangular object. Though it does show a fourth light, the object Steve Tuzer captured is similar. It makes me curious whether or not these lights are part of a, a larger structure. All right, so we see here the stabilized footage. Yep. Uh, the yep. light on the left is the one that I actually pinned. Uh, and again, similar to Tinley Park. Mm -hmm. 
to my eye, yeah, they're to, pretty stable. To but the naked eye, they do seem uh, about the same position. It really does seem to be the structure locked together where we're doing some sort of rotation. So what Terence's analysis is telling us is that these four point sources are clearly locked together in, in formation, but it's a very sophisticated formation where they're, they're not just hovering together, but they're, they're rotating en masse as one object. It really leaves me wondering what this could be. One final photo could shed light on the dramatic increase of sightings in the United Kingdom. As a photographer in Lancashire, captures what appears to be a UFO approaching a tornado. Everybody has said, what is that? The latest wave of UFO sightings over the United Kingdom has seen strange triangles, bizarre silvery objects, and a helicopter pursuit over the Bristol Channel. But the most unique case might involve a UFO and a tornado. Melanie Walwork of the Lancashire Evening Post received this photo days after it was taken. Well, yeah, I thought it was certainly very interesting. It was crazy enough that there was the, the funnel cloud in Lancashire for a start, never mind now with this, you know, this thing next to it that no one was, you know, too sure what it was. But more compelling for Mel is the amount of sightings in the area, especially this summer. Do the sightings tend to come together in certain months of the year? There certainly has been a lot over the, the last few months, obviously the summer months. Lancashire is a hot spot. Though Mel received many calls and many reports, none had the evidence that Pat Regan did when he snapped his photograph. July 6th, 2008. Pat Regan is on a normal afternoon excursion with his daughter Jasmine in Lancashire. He takes this photo when he sees the tornado forming in the distance. When he arrives home, he downloads it to his computer for a better look. At first, it just seems to be a picture of the nearby tornado. But on closer examination, Pat discovers it contains something even more intriguing. Ted and Pat head out to meet Pat Regan and his daughter Jasmine at the exact spot of their sighting, the Rufford Canal. It almost looks like we could have another tornado again today. Yeah. Are these similar conditions now to it's, the day you had it's the It's a little bit cooler than when we saw the tornado. There was blue sky like this, but it was also quite thundery. So Jasmine first spotted the twister around here. Jasmine was playing there, and I heard her saying, Daddy, Daddy, there's a twister, there's a twister. Concerned at first, Pat realizes that the funnel cloud is far enough in the distance to take a photograph. He seizes the opportunity but he realizes he captures something even stranger when he arrives home. There was a speck in one of the pictures, and this is the speck that everybody has said, what is that? Pat enhances the photograph. In what seems to be close proximity to the tornado, he sees a strange greenish disc-shaped object. We don't know what it was. We said, well, could it be something from the Twister? Could it be an aircraft? But all these seem to be impossible because it doesn't seem to be anything like that. So you didn't see the UFO that day? No, we didn't. Well, we, we saw it, but we didn't register it in our brains. It was there because it was on the picture. You know, we only noticed later on. Do you know if, if the Twister caused any damage? Didn't get the feeling it was going to do any damage, but it only seemed to be peaking downwards some distance from actually Earth. It wasn't Earth touching down? It didn't seem to be. But... When you were watching it, did you see any debris getting kicked up? Uh, at the base? No, we didn't. If the tornado didn't touch down, it probably couldn't have picked up something large enough to be the object in the picture. Seems strange to me is that we have a, a sighting of some unknown object associated with a strange meteorological phenomenon. And apparently the object was very, very close near this twister. Are those related? Is there some cause and effect? I'm not sure, but I'd like to find out. But with so many unidentified objects being seen this summer, many are asking why the British government isn't seriously investigating this UFO wave. The British government has upheld the importance of UFO investigation for years, 
and recently declassified the largest number of UFO investigations in this country's history. These files contain details of hundreds of sightings of strange lights and objects in the sky from 1978 to 1992. Nick Pope, who led the UFO project at the Ministry of Defense until 2006, examined many of these cases, some of which remain unsolved. The amount of records that the MOD has on UFOs must be voluminous. Oh, absolutely, yes. We've had over 11,000 UFO reports um, investigated since the early 50s. And of course, all these cases now are beginning to come out with the release of the uh, MOD's UFO files, which has started this year. The release of the files has coincided with one of the biggest waves of sightings in the country's entire history. And so the MOD must be really frantic over what you called in the New York Times, Britain's Summer of the Saucers. Yes, it, it is. But despite what seems like transparency, little information on these newest sightings is being discussed. Uh, people are using the Freedom of Information Act to go after the records, and they're not really finding them. Now, I have a theory about this. I mean, a couple of times in the MOD, somebody said to me words to the effect of, oh, well, I'm just going to write to uh, this person about this. And I said, no, no, don't do that. You'll create a paper trail. And if there is no paper trail, then officially released documents aren't telling the whole story. So when people try to research cases like Cardiff today, you're actually partly responsible for the fact that there is no paper trail on Cardiff. Well, I'm not sure if it's my personal fault. It was just the culture of, of on sensitive issues, we were aware of FOI and sometimes did a, what you might call a workaround, as it were. Could the MOD's release of the classified files just be a smokescreen for their current UFO investigations? You can guarantee that even if there is no paper trail, the MOD is well aware of these cases and investigating. With solid meteorological data, field perspective, and a photograph, this may be the investigation's best chance of determining what's in the skies over Britain in the summer of 2008. An extraordinary photograph involving a tornado and a possible UFO has surfaced in Lancashire in the UK. Could this be the evidence needed to validate the numerous sightings sweeping the United Kingdom in the summer of 2008. I'm at the University of Manchester at the Center for Atmospheric Sciences. I'm about to meet with Dr. Grant Allen, who's an expert with tornadoes and twisters. I'm hoping that Dr. Allen can give me some information about the tornado that I can use when I get into the digital image processing. Uh, this particular tornado we're looking at here is um, a very, very weak tornado uh, with wind speeds, I would say, probably less than, less than 80 miles an hour at the vortex edge. Does, this, does it look to you like this has touched down? I wouldn't say so. Normally, when a tornado forms at the top of the cloud, you get a, a thicker area, and that tapers off as it, as it descends, and you, you can see yeah. that. One question stands out. Is this object just a piece of debris picked up off the ground and tossed out by the tornado. Dr. Allen worked up an estimate on the strength of the tornado, detailing the force needed. The maximum velocity around the edges of the funnel was about 80 miles per hour. That at as little as 10 meters away, it could be half that velocity. So we know that the velocity of the air around this funnel is dropping off very significantly. And obviously, it would take very strong winds to keep some sort of debris or object up in the air. If the tornado had touched down, and if that's a relatively large piece of debris that's left over, I would expect to see more evidence of debris either around the tornado or off this, off, off this picture, maybe. We've looked very closely at, at, throughout the entire frame. And that's really the one and only piece of debris that we're seeing. And it seems to be about halfway up the funnel. None of those photographs has the tornado been anywhere near the ground. So my hunch is that that is not debris. 
With this stage of the analysis complete, Ted turns back to image processing to determine the size, speed, or distance from the camera to the object. The question here is, what's the object? You know, an aircraft, a bird, uh, an insect, uh, is, can we get our hands around this in any way? My first impression is that it is something of medium size at a pretty good distance. I am seeing what looks to me like motion blur on the object. Motion blur happens when the object being photographed moves faster than the camera and film's ability to capture cleanly. It is usually affected by the camera's shutter speed. Let's look up the shutter speed. Five thousandths. Right, so that's really fast. Shutter speed on a camera dictates whether the photo is sharp or blurry. Pat Regan's camera shutter was set to open and close at one five thousandth of a second. This extremely fast speed clearly captures the estimated 80 mile per hour winds of the tornado, but not the alleged UFO. It seems like it would have to move pretty fast when, in that very fast exposure time to still be blurred, because anything else that was moving at any kind of relative speed, even 80 miles per hour, a fast right, car, right. I would expect that to be crystal clear. At that, you're right. At, at that shutter speed, speed right? You're right. Because that's really fast. That's a good point. Further analysis shows the object moving a third of its length in the five thousandths of a second needed to take the photograph. But its exact size cannot be determined. Do we know that it's a physical object? I would say definitively yes. You can see the very uh, dark undershadowing on the foreground objects, and if we zoom into this thing here, we can see it's also it's kind of yeah. more light on top, dark underneath. So there is something physical in frame. Uh, it's not something that's added after the fact or, uh, or very close to camera. Right. No debris in this area is to be expected, and yet there's this large object in there traveling at a very high rate of speed right next to the tornado. So it's very curious. There's a lot of unanswered questions. A mysterious flying triangle. A metallic sphere shot by a professional photographer. A large, fast object that doesn't look like any known craft approaching a tornado. This has been a really fruitful trip. We've been able to collect what, in my impression, has been some of the highest quality photographic evidence I've ever seen. From conducting our own experiments, I'm of the opinion that there actually was some kind of unusual object that interacted with this helicopter. We found that even though the MOD is releasing its files, it's still keeping mum about cases. We're left with the possibility that we will uncover the piece of thread that will unravel the whole secret and finally reveal the truth. But even as the summer draws to a close, the events continue. September 7th, just outside of Southport, near Pat Regan's sighting of the tornado object, residents flood emergency services with reports of a blazing object falling out of the sky. September 13th, in Bristol, near the Cardiff helicopter incident, five bright orange lights circled the night sky. And September 22nd, reports of triangular lights pour in from the towns of Rose, Johnston, and Boris. As events escalate, and with more and more witnesses, the truth may be just a sighting away. Some say it was an extraterrestrial craft. Others, a secret weapon test gone wrong. But whatever two women and a young boy encountered on a Texas road, it was dangerous. First thing that come to her mind, you know, it was the end of the world. What type of sighting could cause burns and injuries? Everywhere you can imagine, she had blisters. Now, nearly 30 years later, clues emerge. Theoretically, it could have happened. And another story surfaces of a police car hitting a UFO head on. It happened to a reliable, credible law enforcement officer. A family with signs of radiation poisoning. A strange collision. 
Are we encountering aliens or our own bizarre creations? This is case number 80103, Alien Fallout. Somebody needs to admit to what they've done. I just want answers for what they've been hiding for 28 years. December 29th, 1980. The Piney Woods of Huffman, Texas. At approximately nine in the evening, Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum and a seven-year-old boy, Colby Landrum, are driving home to Dayton on Huffman New Caney Road, 30 miles northeast of Houston. The boy sees a bright light in the sky heading straight towards them. This light will soon irreparably impact the lives of everyone in the car. The light descends and reveals itself to be a diamond-shaped object. All of the occupants in the car feel strong heat and the two women are burned. These photos show the blisters that formed on their exposed skin. Possibly as many as 23 double rotor military helicopters arrive on the scene and circle the craft. Though the object and helicopters eventually disappear over the tree line, for the three in the car, an ordeal which will haunt them for the rest of their lives has just begun. Minutes later, a Dayton police officer and his wife observe large military helicopters with searchlights flying above the trees, as if looking for something. Other witnesses claim a diamond-shaped craft flew above them, emitting flames as it moved over populated areas. The incident leads to a full military investigation. But the effects of this incident linger on. Both women suffer mysterious injuries. Years later, according to their families, their deaths are caused by the incident. Now, after decades of loss and lawsuits, no suitable explanation for the helicopters and the fiery craft has been found. Maybe their lives wasn't affected like mine was, but somebody actually seen the same thing that I seen that night. They should wake up the American people and demand to know what's going on. The investigation into alien fallout leads to Huffman, Texas. Bill Burns will collect testimony from a retired lieutenant colonel who led the Pentagon investigation into the incident. George Saran was to investigate what role the Army might have had in flying helicopters on December 29th, 1980. Pat Uskert will get details about the injuries from one victim's daughter. These people not only experienced physical harm after these UFO sightings, but also experienced emotional and psychological damage. And Dr. Ted Ackworth will meet a physician who says the three were irradiated by the craft. There aren't too many medical records left over from those days, but what I really want to do is talk to him and get what information he has. The investigation begins in Dayton, where Bill meets with the Mutual UFO Network's Texas director, Ken Cherry. Walk us through it, Ken. What happened? Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum uh, were out on an evening about 9 o'clock, accompanied by Vicki's grandson, they saw something that they described that looked as if the sky had opened up. For the first time ever, the boy, Colby Landrum, now in his 30s, will reveal what happened that night. In hopes of finding the truth, he has agreed to tell his story on camera. Colby, tell us what happened on this road. Right about here, as we was driving along, we started seeing the bright object come over to the top of the trees and uh, 
As we got closer, we realized that the temperature was getting a lot hotter, and my grandmother kind of got frantic, and they stopped in the middle of the road. According to Colby, the craft spews flames and heat down onto the road and the three helpless occupants of the vehicle. What did it look like to you? It was a bright red glowing object. Kind of looked as if you took a piece of metal and heated it up with a torch. It kind of looked like it was on fire, but it was kind of floating. While Vicky and Colby take refuge in the car, Betty, mesmerized, opens the door and steps out. My grandmother went to the dash. You know, she was screaming. Betty had got out of the car and was looking at it, and that the heat was so intense, she couldn't stand it much more, so she got back in the car. Betty was seared by the burning effects of that heat. Vicky was burned, Colby was burned and traumatized by the event. At that moment, helicopters appear overhead. At first, there's just a few but within moments, they're everywhere. As I was counting the helicopters, I come up with a count of about 23. I just remember being real frantic. Finally, the alleged UFO and its escort of roughly 23 helicopters disappear into the Texas night. Colby, his grandmother, and Betty Cash managed to reach Dayton. Since Colby is the only living witness to experience the effects of the incident, Pat begins his search for corroborating evidence. Someone else who may have seen the helicopters and the diamond-shaped craft. Lamar Walker, former police officer with the Dayton Police Department. He was driving with his wife that night when they saw these formations of helicopters. And I was looking out on this side, just glancing out this way, and they was in the first bunch I saw. The first one was right here in front of me. Okay, just you saw the first here. formation right here in front of you. Anything from 9 to probably 12, okay. at what I could see. They was all had their ground search uh, landing lights on. They was definitely sure looking for something. If there is a diamond-shaped craft, as Colby Landrum reports, Walker never sees it. Could you tell me a little bit about the, the helicopters themselves? They was twin rotors, uh, big blade in the front, big at the rear, kind of like uh, the Army would have or the Air Force or something. So in your mind, these are military helicopters? Oh, yes, very much so. These double-rotored helicopters are known as Chinooks and are built for heavy lifts and transporting troops. This is a military helicopter. Maybe we can use the Chinook as a lead and see who might be responsible for what happened that night. Pat meets with Jerry McDonald, another witness, who didn't see the helicopters, but saw something else he'll never forget. When I looked up, I saw this unidentified craft, okay. like a triangle shape. Okay. And in the back of it, it uh, had a, how do you say, acetylene torches. You know that bright blue light when you get ready to cut metal? That was coming off the back of it. McDonald watches the alleged UFO fly right over the town of Dayton, minutes before Betty, Vicki, and Colby's encounter. Now, would you be able to draw a picture of what you saw? I sure can. We've got a triangle shape right here. This was flaming torches here. In front of it was two white lights here and a white light here guiding the craft. Okay. And it went that direction right there. McDonald reveals to Pat that he got sick soon after the incident. I got sick a couple of days later, but for the most part of it, I felt like I, I came unscathed. Jerry suffers from headaches and nausea, but the effects of his sighting are almost inconsequential compared to those of Colby Landrum and the other occupants of the car. I started getting sick after we got back to the house and uh, I had vomiting and I had a couple of blisters on my face, kind of like a sunburn. Uh, did your grandmother have any symptoms too, I guess? My grandmother was very sick. I think Betty had more of the worst symptoms than any of us. The symptoms are devastating. 
severe burns, painful blisters, hair loss. What could cause such overwhelming injuries? Ted turns to Betty's physician to confirm that this was no ordinary illness. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that she had high energy radiation exposure. I didn't get out of the car and wasn't hurt near as bad as Betty or my grandmother. They seemed to have taken the, the hardest hit. The investigation is searching for answers to what witnesses encountered outside Huffman, Texas in December of 1980. Hours after witnessing a diamond-shaped object, Colby Landrum, his grandmother Vicki Landrum, and friend Betty Cash succumbed to a mysterious illness. Ted arranges a meeting with Betty Cash's physician, Dr. Brian McClelland, who treated her for 18 years. I'm wondering if you could just start by describing to me uh, the case. Well, when I met Betty, she had a burn mark on the back of her right hand. And so I asked her how that happened. And she told me that I wouldn't believe her if she told me the story. And I said, well, just try me out. Betty Cash is admitted to Parkway Hospital three times within a month after the incident, with severe burns, blistering, and hair loss. She claims these symptoms are a result of her encounter with the diamond-shaped craft. Dr. McClellan points to a handful of remaining medical records to back his startling diagnosis of Betty's injuries. Well, I have a copy of the dictated parts of her chart from the Parkway Hospital. She was admitted what looks like three times from this chart, and each one of them is consistent with progressive radiation exposure. There are a number of skeptics on this case who just say, that she could not have been irradiated because she would be dead. What, what do you say to that? Well, all radiation does not kill you. It depends on the intensity of the source and the duration of your exposure. And those two factors made it so that she suffered burns, she suffered some superficial damage, but she didn't have a lethal dose. How much radiation would it take to cause these kinds of effects? You'd have to estimate her getting somewhere between one and two grays of radiation, which is a way of measuring yeah. absorption. So it's not a lethal dose, but it's enough to hurt you. Curiously, Dr. McClelland is unable to obtain the vast majority of Cash's medical records from Parkway Hospital, where Betty was initially treated. We send them at least 20 or 30 releases over right. time. But yet you were unable to get information? No. So you've never seen this happen before or since with a request for information? I mean, occasionally they'll send you back, can't find it, right. it's lost, but they never just don't right. answer. So why would Parkway Hospital not release this information to you? I would speculate that they wouldn't release it because it was blocked. It had to be blocked by military or legal means. While Ted continues to uncover the medical facts and records of the case, Pat meets with Betty Cash's daughter, Mickey Geisinger. She was a witness to her mom's horrific injuries, blisters on the face, burns on the arm, her hair falling out in clumps. I didn't know it was my mother. You didn't recognize her? Oh, no. She couldn't open her eyes because she even had blisters on the inside of her eyes, on the inside of her nose, on the inside of her mouth. Everywhere you can imagine, she had blisters. And did you try to talk to your mother, or could I she talk? I tried to. My mother, she was kind of blurting out the words, you know, trying to tell me exactly what happened, but she couldn't. About that time, here comes a police officer escorting me out of the room. Why was he escorting you out of the room? I don't know. Undaunted, Mickey returns and visits her mother multiple times. On one occasion, she finds her mother has been moved to an unlikely room. But they had her isolated to herself. Well, the nurse directed me to the room, but she says, I'll have to walk you to it. And then she takes me into a room downstairs where there's nothing else down there. There was no other rooms, like a basement. And when they went into the room, every one of them had to have gloves up to here, mask on, gowns on, hats on, so they were handling this almost like a, a hazardous material right. uh, zone. And that's what was on the outside of her hospital door, a sign for hazardous material. Okay. 
When finally stabilized, Cash moves to Alabama to live with her mother. Her injuries from the encounter have left her unable to care for herself. There, Dr. McClellan treats Betty Cash pro bono until her death in 1998 on the 18th anniversary of the incident. Doctor, you've seen as much of the evidence in this case as anybody, especially the medical evidence. What's your diagnosis here? Was, was Betty radiated? There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that she had high energy radiation exposure and physical damage from that exposure. Anyone can speculate as to the source of the radiation, and I don't know of anything available to common people that would cause that. The doctor has never met Colby Landrum, but agrees to examine him for this investigation. He tracked her case throughout uh, 17, 18 years. He's actually something of an expert when it comes to radiation exposure and radiation poisoning. And I think Dr. McClelland is the right kind of person to be able to give us an expert diagnosis. First, let's talk about the incident. Do you remember anything about it? I was sick for a week or two afterwards. I never went to the hospital. I mean, I went and got checked out, but I had some burns. Where did you have those? They was on my back and arms. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I remember I couldn't get out in the sun very much for a week or two. Dr. McClellan proceeds to collect a case history on Colby Landrum. Pull your shirt up. Yeah. Kind of the same as, as if you'd had some sun exposure or something. Right. That's about the only changes. Well, that's cool. But otherwise, you're uninjured, right? Otherwise, I have no problems as of lately. Did you lose any hair? Not that I remember. I may have lost a slight amount in the back of my hair from what uh -huh. I remember. But it looks like it's pretty much intact now. No, that's everything everything came back. Fine now. How long was it before you actually felt well? After? I'd like say said, probably two weeks. Never had any liver problems, ulcers in your stomach, trouble with your stomach? Not that I know of. Take a big breath. And out. You can sit up. Though no physical effects remain, Colby is still pained by the experience. Do, but at least you're healthy and you That's can get thing. along. But you really should be doing these checkups at not more than every two years, I, or probably every year. But anything that shielded you with metal would have been relatively protected. But the windows didn't protect you if you were inside the vehicle. Betty only got it because she was outside. If radiation was the cause, Betty probably received the highest dose as she stood outside the car. Vicky would have been next in dosage as she peered through the front window. Colby would have received the least by hiding beneath the dash away from any windows. But the radiation could have affected more than just the witnesses. Is it possible that it was absorbed by the road itself? Bill learns that a crew was seen at the site days after the incident, digging up the road. My grandmother told me this is a section from about here, about 135 feet back, and they stripped the pavement from about this point, 135 foot back towards Inland Road. Well, did people describe trucks coming in and doing this? Well, I had heard from different sources. Somebody had told me that it was black, unmarked trucks that come in here and actually stripped it. It should throw a red flag up to somebody. It sure is a red flag, I agree. If clandestine crews were brought in to repave the road without the county's knowledge, then a core sample of the road should show the resurfacing pattern. If it doesn't match county records, it could confirm the military's attempt to hide the truth. And the lieutenant colonel who originally investigated the case finally comes forward. They had two, maybe three double rotary Chinooks and the rest of them were the type to carry personnel in. On this county road almost 30 years ago, Three witnesses see an alleged diamond-shaped UFO spitting flames and descending toward their car. The three receive burns, and one seems to suffer from radiation sickness. But just before the encounter in Texas, one of the most famous events in UFO history takes place, the United Kingdom's Rendlesham Forest incident. A previous investigation looked into this sighting, 
which involved multiple Royal Air Force bases and reports of strange lights resembling, quote, an aircraft on fire. Before the event, locals had long complained of strange blisters on their skin. And that night, men in a military security detail reported feeling, quote, very hot as the lights approached them. In the days following, strange marks with abnormally high radiation levels are found in the forest. Less than 48 hours after the conclusion of these events, Betty Cash and Vicki and Colby Landrum have their encounter on this road in Texas. Bill has learned that a crew allegedly removed part of the road after the sighting, perhaps to remove traces of radiation. If there is any truth to the story, it could point to a cover-up. Pat returns to the location with Francisco Puentes of Terracon Industries, an engineering firm that specializes in pavement analysis. Two samples will be taken, one from the spot that was alleged to have been replaced and the other from a portion of road outside the contact site. Now, if the road was repaved, will we be able to tell from this sample? We'll be able to see some type of delamination or color difference between the old and the new. Francisco tells Pat that the section of road allegedly replaced reveals unusual features. It's, it's different than typical construction. Typical construction, again, is they remill and put directly on top of the asphalt. Here we have two distinct layers of asphalt. Does that say anything to you? It's, it's unusual, it's not typical. A control sample is taken from 160 feet away. Comparing one to the other, they're fairly similar. Well, the alleged story is that the, the road was actually torn up and, and completely reconstructed, that it wasn't just uh, resurfaced. They actually dug down to the foundation of the road and removed it. But do these core samples show any evidence of, of that kind of total removal of the road? Not completely removed and reconstructed. But Anything abnormal? You have a lot more asphalt than typical construction. It looks like it's been resurfaced a few times. The core samples don't show major differences, but they do add to the mystery. According to Harris County Highway officials, they are unable to find any documentation of repairs, overlays, or reconstruction on this road since 1980. But these two extractions show multiple repavings. The investigation believes the road reconstruction may have stretched further than first thought, and with the discrepancies in the county records, that an outside operation is very possible. But Colby has another lead. He tells Bill that five months after the traumatic events on the road, he and his grandmother crossed paths with someone involved in the incident. During a military exhibition at the county fair, a chance encounter opens the possibility of a military secret. A Chinook helicopter had flown in a date. We went up there to actually see it, and I think my grandmother had got to talking to the gentleman, the pilot. And before he realized who she was and what had happened, he started talking that he was on a mission the night of December 29th in that vicinity. According to Colby, the pilot said his unit was based at Ellington Air Force Base. After my grandmother had confronted him about being out on whatever mission they was on, he kind of clammed up and wouldn't say anything. Military secrecy continues to surround the case, but due to the press received at the time, or another unknown reason, the Army launches a major investigation into the Cash Landrum incident. The report on the topic is classified. The author of the report is Lieutenant Colonel George Saran. His investigation has called much of Colby's story into question. For the first time, he is speaking out about the case and has come face to face with Colby Landrum. The only organization that had that many helicopters was the United States Army. 23 helicopters would be a real logistical operation. Being so close to a major international airport, the air traffic control people would definitely have, it would have been cleared through them. Did you ask them if they had any record of a flight of 23, give or take a couple helicopters, and the answer was no. They had no record. 
but the investigation receives a piece of evidence that distinctly contradicts the lieutenant colonel's claims. A declassified handwritten note by George Saran himself, released through a Freedom of Information Act request. The note states that 100 helicopters landed at Robert Gray Airfield at nearby Fort Hood that same evening. I, I have no idea why I might have wrote that down. In those days, it was kind of a closed down place that was just used on the weekends by the reserves and the National Guard. There would have never been anything like that. Famous last words. I, I don't have an answer for that. But what about the helicopter pilot Colby and Vicky spoke to, who claimed that he was on patrol in the area that night? Lieutenant Colonel Saran's report details the encounter. Quote, Ms. Landrum heard him to say that he was flying the evening of the incident. When pressed for more details, the pilot responded that he was prohibited from adding more information because of national security. I guess my question is why come out and actually tell us that he was dispatched to that area and then after he found out that we were actually the victims that had the encounter out there, retract his statement. I just that, find that very hard to believe. I don't have an answer for that. Something definitely happened here in Huffman, Texas on December 29, 1980. Whether it was above your command, below it, something definitely happened. And I'm not trying to be hard towards you, but you're the only one that I've ever had a chance to talk to involving our government. As far as your commanding officers ever come up to you and say, OK, that's enough. That's all we can do on this. Absolutely not. Never was I told that this is hush hush, off limits, and play this this way or that way, or don't play it at all. With no concrete answers for the ship or military helicopters in the air that night, Saran is sure of one thing. Obviously, something had happened to them. You don't get those kind of burns and the, the kind of problems medically without something happening. I could not substantiate that the Army or any of his assets were involved. Colonel Saran said definitively that the Army had no reports of helicopters taking off from any of its bases. We're now homing in on the possibilities. Could have been black operation. The Army didn't even know about it. We still have to establish culpability for who was controlling that craft. With these questions still lingering, the investigation looks at another contact event that left a victim with both psychological and physical damage. What's the problem? I don't know. Someone just hit my car. What is causing this rash of trauma? and who is responsible for it. The investigation into alien fallout has led to Marshall County, Minnesota. One year before the Cash Landrum incident, on August 27, 1979, outside of Warren, Minnesota at 1.45 a.m., Officer Val Johnson is on patrol in his police cruiser. A strange light appears hovering above the road in the distance Deputy Johnson is traveling at 65 miles per hour when the light begins rushing head-on towards his car. Then, an impact, and Officer Johnson loses consciousness. These are the actual police recordings from that night. Johnson sounds dazed as he reports the accident to dispatch. Johnson's cruiser has a broken windshield, unexplainable creases and dents along the length of the body, and the antenna is bent at a 90-degree angle. Today, Johnson refuses to speak about the incident and has moved to another city. Ted sets out to meet with former sheriff Dennis Brecky, the man in charge of the investigation that night. He hasn't spoken about Johnson's encounter in two decades. 
As far as Val Johnson was concerned, you know, he was a good person, and I haven't yeah. doubted his word at any time. But one angle of Johnson's story is almost impossible to reconcile, and it seems to defy time itself. His clock in the car was 14 minutes slow, and we went to check his wristwatch that night, and that was 14 minutes really? slow. And so the clock in the car was running again when you recovered the car. That's so right. whatever had happened had stopped it temporarily for 14 minutes. Yeah. I gather he was a very meticulous officer. He, he set his clock very carefully, that on his wristwatch and the car That's every how patrol. he reported in. The loss of time is impossible to prove, but the physical damage to the car is very real. Bill and Pat tracked down Deputy Greg Winskowski, the first responder that night. He's agreed to meet at the site of the UFO incident on Highway 220. What did you find when you got there? And I think someone took a shot at him. He was slumped over. I got him back. I, again, I asked him, what kind of car was it? He says, it was no car. He says, it was a light. A light. What kind of light? From a car or what? He says, no, it came out of the air. They came right at me. Deputy Winskowski was one of the first to witness the strange damage to the car. The antennas were bent, the windshield, and uh, the headlight was out. And I could see a faint tire impressions that stretched for about 850 feet and then solid black marks for about another 99 feet where like the brakes were locked up. So would an accident investigator say the engine went off at this point? That was the only explanation I could get. Could the light have possibly disabled the police cruiser's engine and caused the car to skid off the road almost 1,000 feet from the point of impact? One of the only corresponding UFO cases involving damage to a vehicle happened outside Mundrabilla, Australia, in the early morning of January 20th, 1988. Similar to Val Johnson's encounter, a family is run off the road by a strange light. But the incident doesn't end there. The family claims the light lifts their car from above and drops them further down the road. Later, the police would confirm a blown out tire and four separate indentations in the car's roof, and note the presence of a fine black ash on the exterior of the vehicle. Though it has been almost 30 years since Val Johnson's incident, physical evidence has survived. Officer Johnson's patrol car. And Ted has brought in a crash expert to help him examine the effects of this strange encounter. I'm about to meet with Professor George Bible, who studies the forensics of airplane crashes, which I think is really relevant here. So George, here it is. 1977 Ford LTD. I think the damage was mostly down the driver's side, right? So there's the headlight. Some kind of impact around here. Almost all of the, the reflector is gone as well. The clear glass front's all gone. Look here, the impact marks on the hood. Definitely some kind of deformation though. That impact looks a little odd to me. It doesn't seem like that could happen from an impact horizontally. That looks more like a vertical. And then here's the windshield. Can you make out where the impact marks are? Well, hard to say. The windshield expert thinks the windshield had two impacts from the outside and one impact from the inside, which is unusual. The Ford guy said they all happened within a few milliseconds, and they could estimate the speed being very rapid. The description of the accident and the damage to the car don't seem to make sense. Clearly, something impacted the vehicle. But if Johnson was traveling at 65 miles per hour and collided with something head on, the police cruiser should have had severe damage. One piece of evidence may show the true power of the impact. And here are the two bent antennae. One is bent almost 90 degrees, and I gave decided that it just couldn't happen from an air blaster from impact with a hard object. Professor Bible shows why he believes the antenna couldn't have been bent by a minor impact or wind blast. This is a high strength steel wire, mm -hmm. similar to what they had in the antenna. And if you try to bend it back 90 degrees, it has tremendous spring back. Right, you're only getting about 30 degrees out of it. So if it impact a solid object and it bend it back 90 degrees, you can't really bend it further than that. 
right. uh, with a solid object or a wind blast. Now, uh, it, it, you just can't bend it 90 degrees. Right. Now, you could bend it 90 degrees by hand. You gotta bend it more than 90 degrees and let Make it spring it back. Is it possible Officer Johnson faked the incident and bent the antenna by hand? They said that the antenna, while it did get bent to 90 degrees, roughly, that there were still residue left over from bug strikes. Yes. So how would you, how would you keep that with your, if, if it was handled manually? Well, I don't know. That might be a mystery. If the antenna was forcibly bent by Officer Johnson, all the bug residue should have rubbed off onto his hands. But that's not the case. Well, George, we've had a good look at the car. Is there an explanation for all this? No, I don't think so. Any one single little piece of damage is pretty ordinary, but if you put it all together, it is kind of hard to explain. And conversely, something that might have bent those antenna, I don't see how whatever that was could have caused these impacts on the front. That's correct. I don't have a good answer to that either. Lost time, an unconscious police officer, and inexplicable damage to a car. Did Val Johnson really suffer these alien effects from a UFO collision? And are Cash and Landrum's radiation burns and sickness caused by an extraterrestrial craft? Or is this the hallmark of a top secret government plan gone terribly wrong? I was scared. I actually got down on the floorboard and I was kind of peeking over and it looked as if it was on fire. In 1980, Betty Cash, Vicki Landro, and her seven-year-old grandson, Colby, witness a large diamond-shaped object descending out of the sky. Soon, a swarm of large double-rotor helicopters begin circling the UFO. But Lieutenant Colonel George Saran, the military investigator for the cash Landrum incident, says he found no proof any helicopters were ever deployed, but he's willing to concede that there are other possibilities. Had another branch of the military, say the Navy, say the Marines, say some kind of a joint command exercise, been testing something, that would have been out of your purview. No Army base was involved, no Army flight logs under the radar so that it would not have been tracked, and to this day, you wouldn't know about it, and it might have never made your investigation. Theoretically, it could have happened. If the Army wasn't involved, who authorized the helicopter seen by numerous witnesses that evening? Dr. McClelland, who treated Betty Cash for radiation sickness, later hears from eyewitnesses who approach him in confidence. Some are from the military, and they tell him that what Colby, Vicki, and Betty really saw was a top secret aircraft. There were a large number of military people exactly describing the series of events in the vehicle, and they could describe exactly what happened. In one of those, they said there was a vehicle called a WASP-2, which was a nuclear-powered personnel carrier that they were apparently experimenting with, and they matched Betty and Vicki's description of the entire event. I mean, it was perfect. To find out more about the mysterious WASP-2, Bill meets with former Air Force flight test engineer, Bill Scott. Dr. Brian McClellan, he said that other Army people came to him and said, I was involved in a project called WASP-2 that was powered by an atomic engine. The military obviously does have a number of operations involving radiation of some form. Back in the late 60s, I actually suffered some radiation poisoning because of the job I had in the Air Force. It was very classified at the time, and when we did a hot mission, I lost about 10 pounds, I lost some hair, I suffered from some nausea over the next two weeks. Had you ever heard of something called a WASP? Well, the only WASP I ever heard of was an Army test program. That was a one-man flying vehicle, and it has controls and one guy flies it around, and that's the only WASP I've ever heard of. If there was a WASP-2, a second-generation multi-passenger airborne troop transport, it remains classified. And its size, shape, propulsion, even purpose, are total speculation. But what about the very identifiable Chinook helicopters? 
George Soran has said there were no helicopter units operating that night. Could there have been a unit that even Lieutenant Colonel George Soran from the Inspector General's office might not have known of? In 1980, the disaster that we call Desert One, the rescue attempt to try to get the hostages out of Iran. As you know, that went bad. We had a lot of deaths, lost aircraft, etc. So the outcome of that was to form an aviation unit in the, within the Army that train to fly at night, do these deep covert insertions and extractions, and uh, that, that was Task Force 160. But is it possible that Task Force 160 could have been flying literally under the intelligence radar? Definitely possible, because that's what Task Force 160 was set up to do, was to do covert, clandestine operations. Today, the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment is headquartered at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Known as the Night Stalkers, the group officially requires its members to have or be able to obtain secret clearance as the regiment continues to employ new technologies and tactics on clandestine operations. The entire Cash Landrum incident may be explained by a top secret military test gone horribly wrong, with the alleged helicopters there to observe or maybe pick up the pieces. Betty Cash and Vicki Landrum filed a claim for damages against the U.S. Air Force, but it was denied. After its own investigation, the Air Force concluded the U.S. military wasn't involved. Facts failed to establish that the unidentified flying object, or helicopters, were owned or operated by the U.S. government. In response, Betty and Vicki sued the government in a Houston court for damages, but the lawsuit was dismissed in 1986. My mother and Vicki was trying to tell them what was wrong with her. I mean, it was obvious. You know, I mean, blistered, bald-headed, you know, she was sick. And they told her there was nothing they could do. Betty Cash passed away on December 29, 1998. Vicki Landrum died on September 12, 2007. Both women suffered greatly from early forms of radiation sickness and eventually cancer. Now, Colby Landrum is the only remaining victim to experience the effects of the alleged UFO. We have determined definitively that something happens, but I just can't say uh, whether it's terrestrial or something else. We've made some great headway in this case. I think we're getting closer to some kind of answer uh, of what really happened that night. There was one unit equipped to put 20 plus Chinooks in the air, fly a mission, set down, refuel. This is Task Force 160. Whether it was a black project or an extraterrestrial craft, witnesses hold firm to what they saw that night in the piney woods of Texas. And they continue to hope that whatever it was, the truth is close to being revealed. It's been 28 years, so I mean, I still have some kind of hope that the truth will come out. Somebody knows about it.